everyone. Can I welcome you to the 21st meeting of the Education Skills Committee in 2018? And can I please remind everyone present to turn their mobile phones and other devices onto silent for the duration of the meeting? Apologies have been received from Gillian Martin. And in addition, Richard Lockhead is no longer a member of the committee as he's been appointed the Minister for Further Education, Higher Education and Science. And I'm sure we all wish Richard well in his new role and thank him for the job that he did as a member of this committee. Uh, Claire Adamson will be substituting today for uh, Richard. Uh, the first item of business is a decision on whether to take agendas item three and four in private. And are members content to take agenda items three and four in private? Thank you. The next item of business is an evidence session on the education reforms. This is to explore in more detail the next steps following the Cabinet Secretary's announcement in June that the Scottish Government education reforms would be taken forward through collaboration and without legislation at this stage. We have two panels today, and the first panel has representatives from COSLA, EIS and Education Scotland. Can I welcome to this meeting Councillor Stephen McCabe, Spokesperson for Children and Young People for COSLA, Jane O'Donnell, Chief Officer, Children and Young People Team for COSLA, Larry Flanagan, General Secretary, EIS, and Jane, Janie McManus, Strategic Director, Scrutiny Education Scotland. I should say to the panel from the outset that if you'd like to respond to a question, please indicate to me or the clerks, and I will call you to speak. Before I invite questions from my colleagues, I'd like to ask a representative from each organisation to briefly set out their position on the government's decision to progress the implementation of education reforms at this stage, as opposed to introducing legislation. Who would like to start? Stephen? Yeah, I mean, I think we are we are pleased that the, the government has decided not to introduce legislation. Uh, we've been arguing for the best part of two years that legislation wasn't required. Um, we have had detailed discussions with the government, which obviously resulted in the agreement that we reached in, in June. Now, at that time, th there was a presumption that legislation would proceed, um, but obviously the government took the decision not to, and, and we welcome that fact. Um, we are concerned that legislation remains on the table, uh, and potentially uh, we, we don't see that as necessarily an overly conducive towards partnership working, but we recognise potentially why the government's done that. Uh, but certainly we feel that improvement and changes uh, can be taken forward without the need for legislation. OK, thank you. Larry? Yeah, I think we would also welcome the fact that the legislation has been, at the very least, parked uh, for the next year. Um, in most of our discussions with the Scottish Government around the consultation period, uh, we've emphasised the advice which the Scottish Government itself received from its international panel of advisors. That what was required in Scottish education was cultural change rather than structural change. Uh, and our concern was that we would have legislation which was focused on structural change, which then actually had little impact on the classroom. Um, and anything which doesn't impact on teaching and learning in the classroom is, is a waste of time and energy. So I think the approach around collaboration uh, involving both uh, arms of government, but more particularly from our point of view, also involving the profession in terms of how you actually lead from the middle, how you create leadership at school level and how you impact on teaching and learning. Uh, I think the opportunity offered by collaboration uh, rather than the diversion of political debate around structural change uh, is welcome. And from our point of view, uh, we think that the, what's been set out uh, offers a window of opportunity around actually changing the culture of how we uh, deliver education in Scotland, uh, rather than focusing on the, the structures. OK, thank you. OK, uh, Jenny, Jenny, would you like to say something? Thank you. Um, like my colleagues, we, we welcome a focus on collaboration as a key element in terms of creating that cultural change to really support further improvement in the education system. We really look forward to working with our partners in terms of delivering on the joint agreement and that focus on collaboration um, and acting actually as a, as a model um, to support sharing and learning and working together to ensure that we can make the changes required to achieve the best possible outcomes for our children and young people. OK, thank you very much. Uh, Tavish, you... Uh, thank you, Stephen. I wonder if you could just clarify what the... is in terms of what will trigger the use of legislation? Well, 
That's really a decision for the Deputy First Minister, uh, what triggers legislation, or perhaps that, that's a question you, you, you need to ask him. Our understanding, obviously, is that he expects to see significant progress over the next 10 months in terms of the improvement agenda. Uh, we've signed an ag agreement uh, with him. We are committed to driving forward improvement, working with partners, uh, but it will be for the Deputy First Minister to make a decision as to whether he feels that sufficient progress has been made. That means that legislation is not required. What's your th definition of significant progress? I, I think, again, that's a, a question entirely for, for, for the, the, the Deputy First Minister. Our officers are continuing to engage uh, with uh, partners in Education Scotland and other professional associations in terms of developing the sort of improvement framework. And I'll, I'll bring Jane in, in, in in terms of where we are with that. But as I said, I think fundamentally that's a, a decision for the Deputy First Minister. I understand, based on a statement he made back in June, that he, he's going to uh, carry out some sort of independent assessment of progress. And, and I think that will be part of the discussions that we have on an ongoing basis as to how, how that assessment will be made. But Jane, do you well, before you know? Jane comes back, can I just tease out exactly what COSLA's position is with the government? Because I think it's very important for the committee to understand that. Um, do, are you still of the view that legislation is not needed? Um, absolutely. Yeah. That, that, is, that is still our view. And, but at the end of the day, we recognised that at the time that the intention of government was to introduce legislation. So through our discussions, we sought to influence that legislation as, sure. as much as we could. And, and that, that is set out in the agreement dated the, the 28th of June. But at the 12th hour, the, the, the Deputy First Minister decided not to introduce yeah. the legislation. That came as a surprise to us because yeah. we, we anticipated legislation w w would be introduced. We're happy that it hasn't been introduced. We're not so happy that it's sitting there on the shelf. Yeah. But as far as we're concerned, uh, the agreement with government is as set out in that document date the 28th of June, and we, we will uh, do what we can to implement that agreement. And your view would therefore logically be that that the work that you've briefly introduced today will be enough to ensure that that legislation is not needed. In other words, the collaboration that the whole panel has described this morning will be will be adequate to ensure the Deputy First Minister doesn't need to trigger the use of legislation. I, I certainly would be hopeful. I don't think there will be any lack of commitment on the part of Scottish local government. I mean, we would argue that uh, this isn't being forced upon us. We are committed to the improvement agenda. We represent communities of the length and breadth of, of Scotland. We interact with uh, the education system and young people on a day-to-day -day basis. We see the difference that education can make in our children's lives. Yeah. I've got children at school myself. We want to see um, improvement. We want to see every young person get the opportunity to fulfil their potential. So we've got a passionate commitment towards the improvement agenda. We, we believe that that cultural change, as Larry referred to, is better made in partnership rather than being imposed. There is often a case for legislation. We, we think in this instance there's not a case for legislation, partnership working and a real focus and determination to close that poverty-related attainment gap and to give young people with additional support needs the best opportunities in life. A real partnership and a focus on that is what's required, and structural change, etc., is just a distraction. Mm. No, thank you, and I appreciate all that. Two head teachers said to me at home in Shetland at the weekend, but this is still hanging over us. They could still pass laws that would change, for example, head to introduce a head teacher's charter and back it up by law and all the rest of it. I presume you're very well aware of, especially as you're a parent like me, of the pressure on teachers caused by, the, the, as, they, as some would see it, the threat of another law being imposed upon the top of them. Absolutely. I mean, Larry obviously can, an, can answer for his, for his own members, mm, but certainly sure. the head teachers that I've engaged with over the last couple of years have, have certainly been concerned about the potential implications of, of legislation and how that may affect their, their role. Uh, and, I, I mean, I, I think that the government might tell a a different story in terms of their interactions with head teachers, but certainly uh, the interactions I've had with head teachers and my own authority would suggest that yeah, th th they've got those concerns. Um, but I think the onus is, is on us all uh, within the education system to, to try and ensure we, we keep a focus on our young people and, and improving outcomes for our young people. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, Oliver? Thank you, uh, convener. Um, you've said that you think that this is the right approach um, wh why then do you think it's taken the best part of two years to get to this point? Again, I think you might need to ask that question of the Deputy First Minister. We've been arguing consistently for, for two years that I've 
as have EIS professional associations, that legislation wasn't required. Uh, we went through various consultations, made various submissions, uh, and even, in a sense, as I said, on the 28th of June, when that agreement was was uh, was made and, and was endorsed by, by by council leaders, there's still the expectation that legislation uh, was to be introduced, and, and the government have have uh, decided not to. I, I'd like to, to hope it was. Um, as a result of um, the passionate way in which local government officers and elected members uh, demonstrated our commitment to part of local government to, 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 to drive forward change. I don't know, the parliamentary arithmetic might have something to do with that, but that's a question you might want to ask of the, the Deputy First Minister. Um, and Larry, sorry. Okay. Yeah, I sorry. mean, I, there has been a tension between Scottish government and local government around essentially who runs Scottish education. Um, and that political tension has been there for a number of years. Um, and I know Scottish Government have a certain frustration that delivery across local authorities is, is not even as they would see it. Um, but equally, you could say some of the ambitions around this reform agenda are already in practice in a number of local authorities. So across the country, we have head teacher members who are supported by the local authority around appointments processes, for example, or around resourcing or around leading the curriculum. Um, if we want to change the culture to move to a situation where this is uh, more evenly spread across practice, um, you know, from Shetlands to, to Dumfries, then it is about how you actually support schools. Um, and I think one of, the, one of the influences that has occurred most recently has been a successful establishment of the, the regional improvement collaborators because there was a lot of discussion around what they might be and what they might not be, uh, and concern that there would just be another layer of bureaucracy, another layer of management in a system already heavily top-down. Now, the early experience around the collaboratives has been much more productive, so that there's been a, there has been a collaborative approach and a relatively light-touch approach, um, where the collaboratives have been looking to fill the, the pedagogical leadership support that local authorities have lost through austerity measures over the past decade. So I think that, that might have been one of the, the areas where the potential for collaboration uh, was being evidenced, um, because that, the collaboratives were in effect brought in before the uh, final decisions around the legislation. The other area which I think is very important, apart from you know, lobbying within Scotland, uh, I think the International Council of Education Advisors have had a significant influence on the Cabinet Secretary's thinking. Uh, because they are uh, world-renowned experts in collaborative practice. Uh, and their advice was quite strongly, do not legislate where you don't have to. So I, I think that has had some bearing on the uh, thinking of Scottish Government. Uh, and the, the collaborative approach that has been laid out, uh, I think, does offer a way forward. Uh, I, I do have a concern around significant progress. Um, because frankly, if we're talking about changing the culture, the idea that we're going to do that in a year is, is uh, fanciful. Changing the culture of Scottish education is a decade-long uh, agenda. Uh, significant progress for me is that we're all still, still sitting around the same table in a year's time, uh, because we are at least then collaborating on the agreed agenda. Uh, and I do think it was interesting the two head teachers you referenced felt they had something hanging over them. Because we actually need to get rid of that idea that there are threats uh, uh, sitting behind uh, the offer of friendship around collaboration. Um, that, that in itself inhibits the, the courage that's needed to actually develop collegiate and collaborative practice. So uh, I, I think it would be good if we had a, an early signal that the collaborative approach is working and that the legislation isn't going to be required. Because uh, I think the idea that there's a big stick waiting there um, is not conducive to the idea of collaborative practice. Uh, you know, you don't you don't get kids to collaborate in a class by threatening them detention if they don't collaborate effectively. So uh, the big stick removal would be useful. Um, just to follow up on that point, so I mean, listening to what you're saying, would you agree that by keeping the legislation there, it does undermine sort of confidence and trust? And why then do you think the, the cabinet secretary doesn't uh, trust that? Uh, you're going to deliver on the agreement? Well, I, I think you're, you're, 
you know, you're inviting me to get involved in the world of politics there, and I'd rather not. <laughs> I mean, I, I, the motivation, I presumably, is because uh, the Cabinet Secretary is keen to progress his agenda uh, and feels that if progress wasn't being made, he would want to accelerate uh, implementation of a number of these ideas. Uh, my view is that, um, actually, if you believe in collegiate and collaborative practice, you have to create a framework to allow that to flourish. And that framework is one where trust is actually taken as a given uh, from the start of it. So um, I, I don't anticipate the legislation ever coming back to Scottish Parliament because I think there are enough committee partners to the uh, agenda to make sure that it does progress. I think it's an agenda which, you know, given different nuances here and there, it's an agenda which everyone has signed up to. So, uh, frankly, we're in difficulty if, if uh, all of us in Scottish education can't collaborate on agreed uh, objectives. Um, and then my final question was just a, a process one, and it was just to ask uh, you both when the Scottish Government first approached you uh, with the suggestion of a non-legislative solution, so specifically in terms of, of, of the timescale. I think from our point of view, we approached them with that agenda. That was, that's been our whole submission for the last year. When did, they, when did they come back to you and say that that was their preferred option? What was the first indication? In terms of suspending the bill? Yeah. Um, shortly, before, shortly before that announcement, we didn't, we didn't really have any kind of full knowledge of it. So you signed up to an, an agreement to, to proceed on that basis? Just well, if, if, if you read our submission, one of our concerns was we, we weren't actually part of the agreement. The agreement was between COSLA uh, and Scottish Government, and we've actually raised the point that if you don't actually bring the teachers on board, then all of that collaboration is about uh, jurisdiction. It's not about actual practice. And Stephen? Yeah. Yeah, well, we were made aware of the decision not to bring forward legislation or to, to put legislation on the shelf shortly before the, the announcement was, was actually made. And if you read the, the agreement dated the 28th of June, that absolutely is predicated on the fact that there would be legislation. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, Mary? Thank you, um, Convener. Just, just following on the issue of how you, you, you measure progress, um, and the panel have um, said that there are concerns that the legislation is, is still on the table. It's almost just kind of sitting there waiting to be brought back out if, if progress isn't achieved. What, if any, discussion has there been um, within the education reform joint agreement about how that will be taken forward, how you will resolve, for example, disputes? If, for example, COSLA think sufficient progress has been made and the government don't, or if the government come along and say, well, we've made enough progress and COSLA don't think, has there been discussion on how you will take that forward? Following on from, obviously, the joint agreement, officers have been meeting over the, the summer period and continued to meet to take that agenda forward. So I think it would be appropriate for Jane and, and Janie to, to, to give a wee bit more detail on that. So just to, to clarify, then, from an officer's perspective, um, colleagues have been coming together following the announcement um, in June 2018. Um, it is a very constructive um, area, and officers are working very well. Um, we are already discussing the importance of trying to meet that um, sense of what, what progress looks like. I think the group has just expanded, so it was just Scottish Government Education, Scotland and COSLA, and now we are uh, joined by colleagues from the professional associations and trade unions and by the Chief Social Work Officer, which I think is a really valuable addition to the group and helps us get that whole child approach going forward. So. I, like Larry, I'm, I'm, I am fairly confident that the people in the room are so committed to making this work that we will have those very mature and sensible discussions at officer level at the earliest possible stage if we think we're not going to get there. However, we're working in a political context and because the leaders and the COSLA Children Young People Board have full oversight of our actions as officers, we will be regularly liaising with our politicians. And I think it would be a matter of political discussion between the Deputy First Minister and, in our case, Councillor McCabe, if there was any concerns. But that would be done at the earliest possible stage because so much rests on this going well. So have there been any discussions about the criteria around what success will look like? Because I think it's important going forward that everyone that's involved in this knows what the, the, the certain set of circumstances are that would be judged as success. You can't measure something if there is nothing to measure it against. I think, so just, just to clarify, uh, uh, 
convener through yourself. Uh, the group have confirmed twice now that we are fully behind the agreed principles as set out in the joint agreement. That's I think, on page two of the joint agreement, and that that will be our test. So, as we take forward the charter, and um, some call it the head teacher's charter, or the EIS are keen to call it a school's charter, but it's the sense of the principles of we will be empowering head teachers and other professionals as senior officers of the council. We will be making sure that we're focusing on the whole child and putting the children at the centre of our decision making. We will be um, making sure the local authorities' duties around the support that we provide to all our colleagues and to our children is in place. Those are the principles we'll be checking it against. In terms of a formal process, no, but that's not the area we're in as officers. We're in a very collegiate, collaborative place where we're talking actively about how to deliver those principles in the joint agreement. And does does COSLA have a view on, on, on these principles? And how you how you will empower people? And how you will benchmark and, and perhaps Councillor McCabe could, could answer? Well, well, ultimately, the, the test will be that there are improved outcomes for, for young people. I mean, it, this is about processes, but the, the objective is outcomes. It's about ensuring more young people achieve their potential, uh, whether that be children who, who suffer from, from poverty or children with additional support needs. That's ultimately what the objective yeah. is, and, and to drive forward that, that change. Uh, as Larry said, I mean, cultural change doesn't happen overnight, but... I think there is evidence of cultural change happening in, 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 in certainly the, the schools in my area through, for example, the attainment challenge, where I think providing additional resources, and I have to accept where those additional resources may have came from, would be a reduction in other areas of council's budgets to, to finance. But, but that real additional resource has brought a real focus on improvement, which has saw not just schools, but uh, partners in the third sector, different council services, all focused on supporting children, but also supporting family and making a, a real difference. And certainly the early evidence in, in, in my council is that progress is being made. And I know Education Scotland have been inspecting attainment challenge authorities, and it'll be interesting to see the, the outcome of those inspections. Uh, but I think there is real evidence of cultural change at that local focus level. And I think if we can develop that and grow that change nationally, but. Fundamentally, at the end of the day, I think we have to resource our education system. We have to support uh, councils in delivering. And I mean, we talk about empowering head teachers or empowering schools. I'd like to see local authorities empowered. And I think the only way to empower local mm. authorities is to, is to ensure we have the resources we need to do the job that we've been asked to do and the flexibility within the different funding streams that we have. And that's a challenge back to you as uh, elected members of this parliament about ensuring that we do have the resources we need to, to do the job you're asking us to do. But Again, perhaps Janie wants to come in. And, and I, th I think in part of the element around empowerment and what it looks like, I, I think we have an, e an education system where um, we see you know, really strong practice in a number of our schools, and I also see outstanding practice as well. So there are elements that currently that we see head teachers acting on areas where they're making decisions within their school, within their school community that are suitable um, to the needs of the context from that. And we see examples where by in schools we have all the stakeholders that are involved in shaping the visions, the values um, and the aims of schools and the parents and partners and children are involved in helping to shape that. So those are some features um, of empowerment um, that we see currently in our schools. And I think a key element for that is taking the building blocks of what's working really well and actually how we can share that much more widely to get. We've heard talking about consistency this morning, but so that we can get consistency across all our schools. Um, and as a group and as a being a member of the steering group and that, the commitment around the table to working together and working things through is really evident um, to ensure that we can really make um, the, the joint agreement and delivering on that successful for all the children in Scotland. Can, can I ask just two very brief follow-up follow questions? Thank you. Continue. Very brief. Thank you. When you talk about consistency, is there enough flexibility within the agreement that, that you now have to ensure that differences across the, the, the country, because not every local authority is the same, 
So there has to be a degree of flexibility within local authorities to say, yeah, we have to meet that and we have to meet that, but this is why we're not meeting that. Is there enough flexibility? Yeah. I think there is significant flexibility around uh, how local authorities manage their, their schools. Um, but there are kind of obvious benchmarks of good practice that we would hope through the partnership to see replicated. So, for example, yesterday, at uh, the first meeting of the group, implementation group, we, where the professional associations were uh, in attendance, heard about, I think it was in North Ayrshire, where through the local negotiating committee, they have agreed every school should have a consultative committee on the curriculum and on uh, the, the PEF spending. Now, in terms of our ambition around democratic schools, that's a fairly simple idea. Uh, it is not commonplace across the country. As it used to be back in the 80s, every school had finance committees uh, with representation. Now, just actually taking that idea that's been established and well, exists in a number of local authorities and actually having it uh, disseminated across the country gives us one of our benchmarks in terms of are we making progress. Um, I think in terms of the ambitions of the, the bill, uh, the head teacher's charter, or the school's charter, whatever it ends up being, is a fairly obvious outcome that you would expect to be in place over the course of this year, um, because it is a discussion around what that will articulate. Um, the SNCT will be charged with, already has been asked to give advice around head teachers' involvement in appointments processes. Um, because there are employment uh, law considerations as part of that. That's not going to be difficult because in a number of local authorities you already have head teachers involved in school appointments. So it's about actually putting on the table where the best practice is and looking at how we, um, we actually manage to disseminate that. But there are other areas which are going to be really difficult. So the ambition around greater parental involvement, for example, has to be more than getting a few parents on a parents' council. It's about how the school actually engages with the home life of parents. Uh, and given some of the challenges that poverty brings to a lot of families, that, that is going to be a longer burn around how you actually put in place the resources. Homeschool link uh, officers in every school is a step towards that. But then you do have to look at collaboration across social work services, children's services, to ensure that you're getting a stronger interface because Having a, having a schools council is a useful thing, but actually the most progress in terms of young people's learning will come through a stronger connection between parents involved in their own children's education. And that requires a uh, resource to make sure that parents and teachers get the time to talk to one another about children's progress. So some of these, I think, you know, we, will not have, we won't be ticking a box on that in a year's time to say we've overtaken that. But we might be able to say, well, we've actually established some good work in that. So I think there will be a, I think there will be a fairly, we will be able to articulate quite quickly. Here, here are definite areas of progress around the, the ambition of the bill, and here are work streams that are in, in tow, but will take some time to uh, materialise. And just finally, the, the EIS submission, you say that the Education Reform Joint Agreement fails to cite a role for professional associations. Now, I may have picked up something that Jane O'Donnell said earlier. Um, can you just clarify, are staff associations involved with this or not? The, um, we were invited uh, around a fortnight ago, I think, um, to nominate for the, the working group that's looking at the governance arrangements. We weren't involved in the the discussions around the agreement between mm -hmm. local government, um, but we are involved now um, in the ongoing work. Um, and we, we're, we're just keen that uh, professional associations are also involved in the pedagogical work mm -hmm. that should be part of this, because um, although we, as a trade union we have some expertise, our members in schools are essentially teachers rather than trade unionists. And it's actually harnessing their pedagogical input to the mm -hmm. leading from the middle that we're keen to see um, as a main work stream in the programme. OK, thanks for that. Thank, Thank you, Ross, then. Convener, I'd like to uh, explore the Head Teachers Charter issue a little bit more, given the prominence it had in yesterday's programme for government. It's obviously still very much a, a priority for the government, but both EIS and COSLA at the start of this process two years ago and since then have been very clear in the issues that, that you had with what was originally conceived. 
Do you think the direction of travel now is heading towards something more like what the EIS has outlined about a schools charter and less of the impairment or, or potentially burden of the, the kind of heroic individual model? Is the trajectory towards something that you would see as a positive contribution or are we still heading towards the, the potential challenge of overburdening an already overburdened individual? Well, I think that's a really critical question for the whole process um, because the, um, the role of formal leadership is really important in Scottish education. So head teachers and deputy heads, subject leaders, uh, do have a critical role in terms of uh, curriculum development and implementation. Um, and we do in Scotland talk about leadership at all levels and school leadership. Uh, it's just when it comes to practical outcomes, we always end up talking about head teachers. So, the, so in a secondary school, for example, the head teacher will be one of an extended leadership team. Um, and if we're talking about changing the culture, the head teacher is important in that, in that dynamic. Um, but there'll be five or six other people who are critical to the culture of the school. Um, so we, we are very keen um, and, and in primary schools where the head teacher can quite often be the only promoted per person. Uh, if you don't have a collegiate approach, um, you're in a very lonely place. You know, so you have to work as part of a team. So we, we are really keen that we stop talking about head teachers per se and start talking about collegiate practice in schools and, and democratic accountability. Because head teachers, for example, in secondary, the, the work that the RICs are doing around leading from the middle, that's not about head teachers talking to head teachers. That's about an English PT liaising with another English PT around the curriculum resource. Uh, because head teachers. Uh, aren't, the, aren't the subject experts in secondary schools, it's the, it's the curricular leaders. So I, I think when you speak to the Scottish Government, they will acknowledge all of this agenda, right? So it's, it is about empowering schools. But in the original consultation document, the only people not cited were teachers. So we talked about head teachers, parents and pupils, but we didn't actually talk about empowering teachers in that document, even although that was a, the general uh, the title for the programme. Um, and one of the things that the International Council of Education Advisors have been very, very strong on is how you actually develop pedagogical leadership at school level, because that is what makes a difference in the classroom. Right? Who, appoint, appointment of staff is important. It's not critical to classroom practice. Right? Budget, budget accountability is important. It's not critical to classroom practice. So it has to focus on how you improve teaching in the classroom so that learning is more effective. And that's where in our view, collegiate schools, collaborative schools, are much more critical than a head teacher's charter, which only says what the standard for headship says anyway uh, in the GTCS uh, uh, website. Is the direction of travel headed towards that from where we were roughly two years ago when consultation processes started, or do you think that we are still, <coughs> that the government is still essentially focused on the approach that they had two years ago that you raised these concerns about? Um, I think, the, I think there's been some movement uh, towards that broader concept. Um, I still think there's an over-focus on head teachers per se. Um, and whilst the, head, the terms of the head teachers charter has been refined to be something a bit more manageable around leading the curriculum, uh, rather than turning into HR specialists, uh, from our point of view, that's still a big agenda for us to pursue within the, uh, the consultations. We obviously had concerns around the head teacher's charter and essentially the lack of checks and balances, and we consistently argued that with the government. So, in terms of the agreement we reached, we are satisfied with the progress that was made, and those checks and balances have been built into the agreement. But I think we would endorse the view of the EIS that we should have a wider focus in terms of leadership within schools, and and I think that is part of the discussion that's taking place in the, in, in the working group and. Hopefully, we can we can make progress in, in that direction. And just to, to go back to the point that Mary Fee made around the variance, there's obviously a variance between local authorities in terms of the level to which head teachers are already impaired. But there's also the variance between what what is and is not appropriate. And I'm wondering if how a, a single charter can be both tangible enough to genuinely empower head teachers, but also applicable 
in every situation, the difference between primary, secondary, special schools, the difference between urban and rural, uh, the difference between different levels of, of affluence that, that affect a, a school's functioning. Do you think that a single charter can be both tangible enough to genuinely empower individuals, but also applicable enough across the board in the massive variety of school environments that we have? Well, I think it, that will very much depend on what's uh, eventually in the charter. Um, from my point of view, I see the charter, however it's you know, uh, labelled at the end, as really setting out the ambitions for collaborative practice in schools. Um, I, I don't think the charter is going to empower head teachers in a way that they currently can't operate, because all of the things that the charter talks about doing already happens, not, not consistently across the country, but certainly happens in, in various local authorities. But I think the A charter may well be a useful totem to actually remind us of the ambition of empowering schools and leading from the middle. We're going back, we're going back to the 2001 agreement that talked about collegial practice. So in 2001, we talked about collaborative practice, collegial leadership, distributive leadership as being the hallmark, that we, or what we intended to be the hallmarks of Scottish education. When we surveyed our members two years ago around workload uh, and the impact of working in a collegial school, uh, there was a direct correlation between people who felt their workload was more manageable in collegial schools, but fewer than half of our members responded saying they thought they worked in a collegial school. And that was 15 years after we set out the ambition around having collegial schools. So from my point of view, the Charter is, uh, if we're going to have one, um, is, a, is an opportunity to restate the ambition around how we want our schools to operate, rather than a subset of powers. Um, that have to be articulated. You know, that, that, the idea that a head teacher doesn't lead the curriculum in the schools, uh, where does that come from? Because that is exactly what the, the, the standard for headship says uh, in terms of GTS standards, and that should be the norm. Uh, so if it's a, a case of reminding people what the ambition is, the head, charter, head teacher charter or a charter may be useful. Um, but I don't see it as being uh, anywhere near as radical as maybe some people thought it may have, may have been. And just finally, um, Larry, do you, are, are you confident that teachers will have a voice in the process of developing this as it goes forward through yourself, that, that, that those concerns will actually be taken on board because the process will accommodate them? Well, that, that's our main work stream uh, in this programme, to make sure that teachers' professional voice um, is enabled as part of the process. Uh, frankly, if that doesn't happen, the whole thing's a pile of mints, to, to use a Glasgow term. Uh, because if teachers aren't empowered, if teachers don't feel in a stronger place at the end of this process, then all we've done is tinker with structures. If we haven't actually changed the practice, we won't have improved the learning for a, a single child in the country. So it's not just a kind of ambition, it is a prerequisite of success that teachers are actually part of this process. Thank you. OK, thank you. Liz, did you want to come in at this point? Uh, yes, I do. Thank you, convener. Um, Councillor McCabe, this time last year, both the First Minister and uh, John Swinney himself said very uh, forcibly and unequivocally that this bill was absolutely essential in terms of driving Scottish education forward. And that was repeated in committee, it was repeated in the chamber many times. What factors do you think were at play to make the Cabinet Secretary and the First Minister change their minds? Oh, I think only the, the Cabinet Secretary and, the, and, and the, the, the First Minister can answer that question. I mean, I certainly would hope that they have listened to the representations that have, have been made, both by local government, by trade unions, by parents, by uh, professional associations, and, and, and reflected on that and, and came to the conclusion that this agenda could be taken forward in partnership. But, Councillor McCabe, you have signed an agreement uh, with the Scottish Government. Surely there was some discussion about the reasons uh, for the complete um, climb down on this issue. You must be aware of what the Scottish Government was saying as the reasons for making a big U-turn. Well, the, 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 the Deputy First Minister 
issued a public statement along with a joint statement along with myself at the time when when the agreement was published and he, he I believe made a statement to Parliament and, and outlined his views and and I think you, you need to refer to the parliamentary record but my understanding is that he felt that the improvement agenda could be taken forward quicker working in partnership and collaboration rather than waiting to go through a parliamentary process so you really need to to, to pose that question to him now, i'm much more interested in what the agreement uh, actually says councillor mccabe um, and whether there is discussion just to pick up on the line of questioning that mary fee had that there must have been discussion about the um the belief that the improvements in Scottish education could now be taken forward without legislation. And therefore, I would hope there had been some discussion about the criteria that would be used to measure that. Because the Cabinet Secretary has kept legislation in the back room just now, and therefore, if it is not delivered, if there is not um, change that we require, then presumably that will then come forward. Now, what I'm interested in is what discussions took place between uh, COSLA and the Cabinet Secretary about the necessary reforms that were required, without legislation now, um, to ensure that there is progress. What exactly will you be measuring and what will you be telling parents um, in terms of wh whether you are succeeding? Well, in, in terms of the, the agreement we reached in, in June and, and the, the, the Cabinet Secretary's decision to, to not proceed with legislation at that stage, what the Cabinet Secretary said to me is exactly what he said in, in the public domain, is that he would expect to see substantial progress and, and, and that would be measured. How that would be measured wasn't made clear at that time, and that's why we have a working group um, of, of officers from, from government, local government and professional associations currently engaged in that process to, to establish what would be the criteria by which the, the, the Cabinet Secretary would decide whether he wished to introduce legislation or not. And again, referring to those discussions are ongoing, and, and, and again, Jane can give you a bit more detail so, on that. So, so, sorry, C can I just establish what the time scale is for this? Uh, pa parents around Scotland want to know exactly what criteria will be used to, to measure whether we are making progress or not. What is the time scale for this work being finished to put in place the criteria which will allow you and the Cabinet Secretary to decide whether Scotland is making progress? Well, I, I think the decision will be the Cabinet Secretary's. I don't think I'll have, have a, a, a say in that particular matter. It's, it's his decision and the government's decision as to whether they introduce legislation. But officers are working in this working group I've referred to and would hope to bring forward a, a proposal within the next few months. Jane, do you want to come in? Yes, uh, th the three year convener. So um, I think it's probably helpful to clarify that I think there is a process to go through by whereby we're looking at the joint principles and trying to work out how that looks on the ground. I think the contribution of our colleagues in the professional association, the trade unions are vital to give a sense of on the ground reality to that for those of us that work, work in a sort of policy area. So we've rightly not identified what that timescale looks like without the contributions of those colleagues who have only just joined us and the meeting was yesterday. I think there is pace behind this in that there's an expectation we'll be reporting to our different politicians at national and local level um, on how we're getting on with that. COSLA leaders agreed fundamentally with all the principles within the joint agreement and as officers we'll be held accountable to make sure we're delivering those but making sure they're also cognizant of important COSLA principles around um, not inhibiting local decision making and asymmetry where it's required in rural areas, remote areas, areas of high deprivation, etc. So the in terms that that's the process. But I think rightly we're on an outcomes based approach for children and young people and we're not going to be able to ident identify a difference in outcomes in ten months. And it's really important that we're just really honest about that. Officers are clear and honest about that. It's a process right now and if the process works, parents should see for in, in communities, their head teachers approaching them with, we need to improve our parental involvement, we need to involve our pupil participation. They should hopefully see some sense of how that's changing for their head teacher if they're talking to their head teacher at pupil council. That will happen in the next 10 months, but outcomes are a much longer period of time, and we're all clear as officers what, what, what we're tasked with at the moment. I understand that some outcomes may take longer, yeah. but can, can I just ask, are we measuring literacy and numeracy? Are we measuring uh, changes to the pupil equity funding? What exactly are we going to be using to measure whether that progress is better next year 
on this year and on the, on the long term. What, what are the factors? Because I think every parent across Scotland wants to know what it is that will be better this time next year and beyond. Okay, so in addition to those high level processes, our colleagues in Education Scotland are undertaking um, a sense of uh, a readiness for a school empowerment and they're doing that with uh, their school inspection timetable over the next few months. They're going to feed that into us in the working group and that gives a sense of where we are as a baseline. And I don't know if, Janie, you want to con give a sense of what that looks like from an Education Scotland perspective. So some of the elements that, that we're looking at um, is that over the course of the next academic year, we'll be carrying out sort of three thematic inspections around the elements of, of empowerment. Um, the first one which um, we'll be looking at is what's the current element and we're focusing that around the principles um, that are outlined in the joint agreement and we will be engaging with um, local authorities, staff and local authorities and, and staff in schools to get that sense of what's the current picture and what ways do they feel empowered at the moment and how they're acting on that. From this, we'll be able to bring that back to um, the steering group to say this is um, a national overview of what's working well, where are the areas that we need to focus on. But I think more importantly is around those examples where we're seeing really strong practice that we can share more widely so that people can learn from it and um, to pick up the areas around, for, for example, parental engagement. Where are the schools that are really um, delivering really well in terms of reaching hard to reach parents and how do they go about that process so that across um, local authorities, schools, we can see and learn from each other and really focus on that collaboration and that collaborative approach to that. All of that. Will our children be better able to read, write and count by this time next year? because that's what it's all about for most parents across Scotland. That's what it's about in terms of raising our standards, which we all want to see. And I appreciate all you're saying about the processes, but the bottom line is, are we going to be able to raise standards in the way that we have to by not having this education bill? That's what I'm wanting to know. Well, at the end of the day, we would argue, irrespective of whether you have the education bill or don't have the education bill, won't make any difference in, in, in terms of, in terms of that objective. Uh, but I mean, that's 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 a, a long-term objective. I mean, the real focus, obviously, the improvement agenda, is to ensure that young people from impoverished backgrounds, young people with additional support needs, really get the support that they need. I mean. There's been a political debate in this country now for a number of years and in this parliament about, about Scottish education and, and people can be accused of talking down Scottish education. And fundamentally, I, I think we have a good education system in Scotland, but it could be better. And this is about making it better and about making sure that young people ha have, have better opportunities in, in life. And I think we need to... I've done it at my local authority level, I had, had to say that um, when I became the leader of the council in, in 2007, we had an ongoing debate uh, around our school estate and reprovisioning and people want to keep schools open, people want to close schools to invest, etc. And whether we used PPP or didn't use PPP. And, and it was far too politicised and we lost sight of the, the, the objective, which was to improve our young people's opportunities. And, and we brought an end to that political bickering. We agreed a plan and we've delivered that plan. And that investment in our schools is providing high quality learning environments in which young people can achieve their potential. And I think that there's far too much politics in our Scottish education and we need to cut it out and really focus on, on our young people. And this is about partnership working. It's about all of us getting together and all of us trying to make a difference. Uh, and we're not going to make a difference here this morning. We're going to make a difference on the ground with everybody. We are real focus on improvement. As I said earlier on, I think the, the evidence is there from the attainment challenge that that focus on, on, on attainment and improvement and providing the necessary resources can make a real difference. And, and, and my plea back to you as elected politicians is when you come to set the Scottish budget um, next February, ensure that we have the right level of resources we need to do the job. OK, thank you. Can, can I just, uh, I'm going to bring in Joanne, but can, can I just ask a question? Um, no matter, I mean, you, in my view, 
you just hit the nail on the head in terms of, of the improvement over the next year. It's not going to matter if there's a bill in place or not, because you're working together collaboratively. But are, is the relationship between local authorities, education authorities, the government and the schools better now than it was two years ago in terms of is best practice getting spread out more? Is it getting recognised more? Is the fact that you're now working to seem to be working together closer, is that having a benefit and do you see it having a benefit in the future? I mean, I can only comment politically and obviously leave it to, to, yeah. to, to others to, to comment at a more sort of office or strategic level. But I, I think relationships are improving, um, not just within the field of education, but, but across the board. I think uh, hopefully in the part of government, there's a greater recognition of the contribution that local government can make, uh, greater respect in terms of our democratic mandate. Uh, and I think if we can build on the sort of partnership work in education and take that forward, I think it can make a, a, a real difference. And, and the fundamental reality at the end of the day, I, I know that all of you in, in, in this room, I know that the Cabinet and the Secretary, I know that First Minister of the Government are absolutely committed to improving the life chances of young people in Scotland. But I have to say, so am I, and so are the, the hundreds of thousands of councillors across Scotland. I. I have had the opportunity in the past year, year and a bit to, to be the, obviously the spokesman for, for COSL and the chair of a Children and Young People Board. And, and I've had the opportunity there to engage with councillors from across Scotland, of all political persuasions. And I believe that absolutely they are committed to trying to improve the life chances of our young people. And they are they are frustrated, I think, in a lot of senses that we've not got the resources to do that, that we're constantly focused on cutting back on resources. And it is nice to get additional resources through things like the Attainment Challenge or the Pupil Equity Fund, but they, they are only substituting for resources that have been systematically stripped out of the system over the last 10 years and are continuing to be stripped out in, in, in other areas of the Council's budget. And if we believe, for example, that poverty is the principal cause of the poverty related related attainment challenge uh, gap. Putting money into to the attainment challenge and focusing it and putting money into pupil equity will, to a certain extent, help. But not if you're stripping money out from other parts of the system and there's not the support there to help families to, to lift themselves out of poverty. Parliament for that, Mr McCabe. But, uh, Mr Flanagan. The EIS has been highly critical of Education Scotland over most of its existence. Um, but one of the elements of uh, the new arrangements um, has been effectively a reboot of Education Scotland, um, so that they are they're restructured to align themselves with the collaboratives uh, and they have, in my view, a much stronger focus on providing pedagogical support to schools. Um, and I, th I think this is hugely critical. Uh, in my view, education policy has been too much driven in the past period by civil servants and not enough by educationalists. So I, I think, um, although it's not an immediate part of the governance consultation, the potential of the work around the RICS, um, uh, promoting the leading from the middle agenda, uh, is, is the most immediate step forward in terms of impact on the classroom, because it focuses on how you provide support to practitioners in the classroom, and how practitioners support practitioners in the classroom. Um, and that is how we're going to get improvements in literacy and numeracy. Not by, not by you know, who's in charge of budget lines, although I agree with the point about increased resources, but actually looking at what changes practice. Because all, and I think, again, all the evidence the international advisors have brought to the discussion is about here is what makes pedagogical improvement in the classroom. Um, and that has to be the focus uh, if we want to deliver improved outcomes. You know, for example, I don't want to start another discussion, if we spent half the time and energy on promoting formative assessment practice in our schools that was spent on promoting the Scottish National Standardised Assessments, we'd be in a much better place in terms of assessment practice in our schools. So we need to focus on pedagogical improvement if you want to deliver improvements in learning. And that's been missing. It's been missing since the regions left, we lost advisors, QIO networks have been stripped out because of budget concerns. Um, and that is a big part of what leading from the middle is, you know, the whole empowerment is offering, a chance to actually revitalise that pedagogical support to schools, because that ultimately that is what will make a difference. OK, thank you. Jenny, do you want to come in? No. All right, thank you. Uh, Joanne? Yeah, um, I don't think... 
mean, what strikes me about this is you, you, you spoke about we, we, ha we share this agenda um, where it's collaboration and delivering the aims of the legislation. I think, Larry, you talked about there's nuance, but it feels to me that there's actually more than nuance and difference. And what the Scottish Government is saying is we're going to get what we wanted by a different route. But both, of course, COSLA and DIS and other teaching unions didn't agree with what was being proposed. So I'm not clear. So, for example, um, COSLA says that the critical role of local government. So you would resist the devolution of too much power to a school. Equally, the EIS has said we wouldn't call it a head teacher's charter because fundamentally change is delivered at a school level in a collegiate basis and it misunderstands the role of the head teacher and head teachers themselves are anxious about the burdens being placed on them. So when you go into the room with um, the Deputy uh, Cabinet Secretary, Deputy First Minister, Cabinet Secretary for Education, and he says we have a shared agenda. What is that agenda? Has John Swinney agreed that the head teacher's charter is not appropriate? Has he agreed there's a fundamental role for local government? Because I have to say to you that yesterday the First Minister, in quite response to questions, simply said, why would you resist what's happening? Because we're going to get what we wanted quicker. So I suppose I want to know what bit of the improvement agenda that you were opposed to have you been able to sustain in your agreement with um, John Swinney? And equally, to what extent do you think John Swinney has acknowledged, I think, very serious concerns about the impact on head teachers themselves, but also in the accountability of head teachers from the proposals that were in the legislation? And can you tell me what you understand, which bit of the legislation in terms of improvement you still disagree with, or other bits that you do agree with? What is the bit that's been not agreed? Uh, or has COSLA changed its position about the role of local authorities? COSLA's position is as agreed in the, the, the document dated uh, the, the 28th of June. So the, the legislation sits to one side. It's gathering dust on a shelf, as I understand. So the reality is that legislation, for all intents and purposes, does not exist. What exists is our, uh, our joint agreement. And, and that joint agreement is a joint commitment to drive forward improvement in Scottish education and to improve outcomes for, for, for young people. And we will obviously try and take that forward, that agreement forward in partnership. And that's what officers are, are doing at this point in time to try and put the sort of the meat on the bones of the principles of that per particular document. And I'm pleased that obviously the, the trade unions and professional associations are around the, 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 the table and hopefully will shape and evolve that. I certainly, COSLA's position is we absolutely agree that Head teachers have a critical role in schools, but we believe all staff have a critical role in schools. And if uh, if we can uh, evolve the head teachers charter into a school charter, that that would be absolutely a, a direction of travel that we would be comfortable with moving in. I mean, I absolutely agree with you. Everybody's committed to improvement, but it's the means by which improvement is achieved is the question. And basically, COSLA didn't agree with the means by which um, improvement would be achieved as identified in the legislation, and neither did the EIS. So what is the, the journey of improvement and what, in what way, because my own view is that what's happening is the Scottish Government is saying the means by which we improve remain the same, but we're going to use a different vehicle for it. And that doesn't address the concerns that were identified, both by those who understood the importance of local government and young people's lives and all the other services round about them, or indeed this Mr Chip's notion of you just give all the powers to head teacher and everything will be fantastic and anybody who's worked in a school will know it's, a, it's much more complex than that. We'd certainly argue in terms of the, the two years from when the first consultation w w was introduced to the 28th of June, when we obviously reached agreement with, with the government, that there has been change in the government's position. Uh, there has had naturally to be movement in terms of our position as well, but we believe that we stuck to our fundamental principles. And, and I think one example, and Jane can, can give more, more detail, but one example would be the Head Teachers Charter and that the original proposals we don't believe had sufficient checks and balances to ensure that head teachers remained accountable to their employers. Uh, and, and at the end of the day, head teachers are, are senior local government officers, and, and like every local government officer, they are accountable ultimately through their line management structure to the council. And we didn't believe there were sufficient checks and balances that we are now satisfied in terms of the principles outlined in the agreement that, that there are sufficient checks and balances, and that's why we could sign up to the agreement. If those those concerns had not been addressed, we would not have reached any agreement with the 
with the government. And as I say, is that the legislation sits, sits to one side at this point in time. It's, it's, it's not part of the discussion that might be hanging there as a bit of a threat. And that's not necessarily conducive to good partnership working. But we are focused on the agreement of the 28th of June and implementing that and putting the detail behind that. And that's what the officers in Education Scotland, COSLA, professional associations, trade unions, the Scottish Government are, are focused on at this point in time and are working towards producing more detail. Solutions in contradiction to your view of how you improve? Well, fundamentally, we don't believe that, that the legislation is required. And, and uh, we think the, legi the legislation would be unhelpful. It's not so much whether it's required. You don't agree with the proposals that were in place in the legislation. You've already said that. And therefore, any suggestion that we're getting the legislation <laughs> or the aims of the legislation by different means is not true. Because you don't agree that no, no. power should be devolved right down to, to, um, to schools. No, I'm that's, not, that's, that's not true. The, 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 the agreement, the, I don't, Jane will keep me right here, but I don't think there's anything in the agreement dated the 28th of June that is different from what's in the legislation. But we don't feel the legislation is, is, is required. The, I mean, the four aims of the legislation that are articulated remain the four aims of the agreement. Um, and I'll come back to the head teacher's charter, but the aim to enhance pedagogical support to practitioners is an agreed agenda. The, the aim to enhance parental involvement in their children's education is an agreed agenda, uh, as is the aim to enhance pupil participation. Um, I think our main concern was, if you try to do this by legislation, then you will fail to get any buy-in from the educational community to this, because once again, it will be something getting done to schools rather than schools being allowed to do something. So our, our, our disagreement around the legislation has primarily been around using legislation as a means to deliver the objectives. The idea of empowering schools, leading from the middle, improving pedagogical practice, those are, those are shared agendas. Um, and, and we are keen to exploit the opportunity. Around the head teacher's charter, I think there was a more fundamental disagreement because there were variations of what does this mean? And we were very clear that some of the loose talk early on around head teachers hiring and firing staff was completely unacceptable because it was a breach of employment legislation. It breached guidelines around uh, equity uh, and ensuring uh, anti-discriminatory practice. Um, and we've kind of, I, I think Scottish Government's position has refined on that, as they actually realised, well, one A head teacher making appointments would be totally inappropriate in any circumstances because of all of the employment uh, legislation concerns around that. But the idea that a head teacher is involved in appointments in their school is something that a number of authorities already do. It used to be in the 80s, it was common practice. So as a principal teacher of English, I was always involved in appointing staff. Um, you know, so it's not, it's not some, I mean, councillors used to be involved uh, in appointing staff. So the principle of being involved in appointments um, is, is not a difficult one to put forward. The practice that developed was really, really around teacher shortages and trying to stop schools competing with one another to get staff uh, or to sign up the best probationers. So there was a certain rationale around not having uh, student teachers going around doing you know, 50 interviews uh, in, in, or 39 interviews in 39 schools in Glasgow to try and get a job. So there was a certain uh, rationale around that. But the head teacher's charter, I think, had that been legislation, would have been potentially more problematic. Um, although I think the proposed legislation actually establishes the principle and then refers it to the SNCT for negotiation. And that's been a change because that's been a recognition that, you know, you can't just legislate where existing arrangements are also in place. Um, what we have said strongest to the DFM is, if you want an example of how legislation doesn't help, look at the named person. Right? The named person took a fairly simple concept, multi-agency support for young children who are vulnerable, and managed to turn it into, uh, you know, where we are now. I, I mean, six years on, we still don't have legislation. Um, thankfully, at, at school level, we do have the collaboration between the agencies. 
So, so our view is if you want to actually deliver successfully the ambitions of empowering schools, legislation is the least effective way of doing that. And that's why we've been opposed to it all the way along. Would you then um, want to change it from a... I mean, my understanding is the National Parents Forum and others think it should be called a school charter. Otherwise, it's just a job description. Yeah, we're, 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 we're really keen that uh, in elaborating this, uh, it becomes it becomes a school charter. You know, we, we've been using the phrase democratic schools, but it's basically it becomes a, a reminder of what collaborative and collegiate approaches to education is, and it's a, as much about empowering the voice of teachers, pupils, and parents as it is about empowering head teachers. So that's that's the agenda that we'll be pursuing in the discussions, um, and, and hopefully we'll have an agreement at the end of that. I was going to ask one question. Sorry, just to provide some clarification, I think um, we were asked why is COSLA signed up to the joint agreement and I think if you look at um, maybe some of the content from Scottish Government on the, these sort of policy areas two years ago to where it is now, it is quite fundamentally different. So COSLA leaders were quite clear that there had to continue to be local democratic accountability for education, we secured that, um, that in terms of regional collaboration that would not be dictated to us but would be a way by which we would agree to collaborate and then it would be for local authorities to decide the best partnerships to be in, that in terms of funding, that local authorities would retain their role around best value and efficiency and effectiveness to support head teachers on funding in relation to the head teachers charter, and it's actually in the draft legislation that head teachers are empowered, but should any of their actions impede upon a local authority's statutory or contractual obligations, then we have the, the responsibility to intervene. These were our red lines at the start when the content and the discussion was quite different and I think it's a sign of perhaps where we've got to in that partnership approach that now exists. What we have now is a lot more reflective of a whole systems approach and that's why we've signed up to it. Can I ask when Education Scotland took the view that it was a good idea to drop the legislation? I think in terms of um, our focus is always on what's going to achieve the best outcomes for our children and young people in terms of what's happening in our classroom. And in terms of our focus has been very much on um, focusing on collaboration and collaborative, collaborative working as a way of creating the culture change, as a way of where there is best practice and highly effective practice that's delivering very well for our children and young people, that we can share that much more widely across the system. And really focusing on the way that we can do that. Um, it's not what I asked you. I asked you when you came to the view that the legislation was a hindrance rather than a help. I think in terms of, of my role um, in the group is to look at the way that we can support delivery of the joint um, agreement of that. So I can I also ask me. you then, have you done an assessment of the benefits of Education Scotland increasing its staff very significantly, I think you say, in your... Um, document as against looking to the resourcing schools. I mean, Barry Flanagan talked about the 80s, I taught in the 80s, and in some ways I had more support as a classroom teacher than a lot of you know, young teachers now. So I wonder whether there was an, uh, an impact assessment in terms of financing of the benefits of significantly increasing the staffing of Education Scotland as against the kind of thing the issues that have been flagged up by Councillor McKay Brown, resources for the core budget to deliver education in our schools. Yeah. I think one of the elements in terms of our um, remit and our moving to looking at uh, our delivery model going forward, it was across looking at across our staff who are carrying out different functions and looking at what we needed for our, our workforce in terms of how we delivered on that. So you, did you do an impact assessment on the benefits of what you see recruiting a significant increase in staff? as opposed to perhaps advocating for increased resources for the core business of education. While you know, funding streams are one thing, but if the fundamentals of the number of support staff, home links teachers, additional support staff in a school are going down at the same time, I mean, did, did Education Scotland do an assessment on that? I think in terms of um, what we're looking at is the, our budget that's set, and I, I don't have that, the budget figures um, with me at the moment, but we've been more than You do say it's a significant increase, as if that were in itself, yeah. by definition, a good thing. And I just wondered if there were alternatives um, looked at in terms of how resources might best be spent. 
Could you send, you said you have that information, did, did, could you send that we information? Send that in, yeah. yeah, thank you. Uh, you wanted to go on to regional collaborative? Yeah, and I suppose I'd be interested in the, the view of, of the panel around what the implications for regional improvement collaboratives are, because I think as argued by um, Larry Flanagan, you can see the compelling argument for supporting people in terms of developing the um, their capacities in the schools. And I wonder whether even with um, faculties at secondary school level, whether there's actually need more need for that because individual subjects, specialisms and maybe weakened. Are you confident that the view that the regional collaborators would become bodies that sucked up power from schools and from local authorities? Have you, do you still have those concerns? And if so, how would we address that? Regional collaborators are not bodies. They, they, they basically are, are officers from councils and Education Scotland coming together to, 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 to look at how we take forward the improvement agenda. And they're about adding value. Uh, we don't see them replicating or replacing what happens at a local level. It's about building on that and adding value. And, and perhaps, as, as Larry suggested, replacing some of the capacity that has been, has been lost um, in the system over the years. Some of that capacity will come from, obviously, the Education Scotland resource that you've, you've been talking about. The government is providing an additional resource to local authorities through a bid process. COSLA is not necessarily particularly happy about that process, but that's the, the, the government's decision. And that additional resource will obviously help us uh, augment the resources that we have, because at the moment we are putting um, resources into the regional collaboratives from existing resources. So it's, uh, it's our existing staff that are, are doing that work. And that's why it's important that if we are committing resource, existing resource, we get added value out of it and we don't end up with duplication. It's about sharing good practice. It's about collaborative working in terms of delivering maybe particular aspects of training, etc. cetera. Um, but it's very much in the early days. Uh, in, in terms of that, and I think it's too early to say whether we've, we've achieved any positive outcomes so far, but I think in principle collaboration can only be a good thing. Collaboration is a good thing, but if it creates a body or a, a, a kind of a, a level that has a life of its own that's producing improvement plans, um, I wonder if you have a concern about that, but can also maybe just ask you to comment on which, what you would have preferred to the process that's now in place, when you talked about a bidding system, what would you have preferred to happen? Well, in, in, in local government, we prefer an allocation process using existing mechanisms for allocating funding. So we would have preferred that we use that mechanism uh, and each council was given an all allocation of funding based on the allocation methodology and the individual councils would have aggregated that funding into their individual coll collaborators. Um, but I mean, it, 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 in, in terms of in terms of the the regional collaboratives, it is a bit, as I said, that added value. And one of the concerns we originally had was the the proposal from government to remove the requirement for local authorities to improve their produce their own improvement plans. So you would have the school plan, you would have the regional plan, and obviously the the, the national plan. And we argue strongly that uh, the council should retain that role in improvement planning and that the regional plan should complement the local plan. The school plan should be informed by and inform the local plan, and the local plan should then inform the, the regional plan, and basically the regional plan should add value to, to, to the local plan. And the government has obviously taken that on, on board, and, 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 and we will continue to produce our, our, our local plans. If it's, but, a, if it's, sorry, if it's about um, collaboration and best practice, is there really any need for a regional plan? Well, it, it's a plan. It's a plan for delivering that collaboration and the ad, added value. And as has been alluded to in the, the paperwork, and I'm sure Education Scotland will confirm that the, the, the plans are all different from all the regional collaborators. There are different approaches being taken in, in, in each of the areas, and and that's that's how it should be. I mean, obviously, my, my council is part of the the West uh, Collaborative, and. Um, our circumstances are quite different from the Northern Lines, for example. I mean, in, 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 in the West Collaborative, there's a number of councils that are attainment challenge councils. So we're obviously focused on particular aspects of, of, of improvement through that. So we're not seeking to replicate that at a, at a regional level. But there are aspects that 
can be coordinated regionally and good practice can be shared reg regionally as well. So the actual, and I think we're, we're heading for the second iteration of the plan, but the, the original first iteration of the, the West plan was a fairly uh, concise document. Uh, and that's as it should be. It shouldn't be a detailed plan that replicates what, what we're planning to do at a local level. I think the collaboratives uh, present an opportunity around you know, that agenda of pedagogical leadership. Um, but I think the EIS certainly had the concern that you expressed around the potential for becoming entities and becoming another layer of bureaucracy. Um, and there's a kind of watching brief on that because although the early iterations have avoided that, there's, there's always the potential for it to slip into that mode. And particularly because, uh, unfortunately, a number of local authorities no longer um, carry directors of education in the senior management teams, um, which we think is, is, is part of the difficulty that education um, is not a discreet a uh, discreetly led uh, agenda in all local authorities. So you could actually see how some of this might just slip to the RICS a little bit then. Um, we are keen that the, the RICS develop their current kind of work stream, which is around collaboration on supporting schools and looking at how you get some scale in some cases, because some local authorities are actually quite small. And um, so you get some scale that actually allows delivery of programs to, to teaching staff that might otherwise be beyond the local authority, or you get some sharing of good practice. Um, the, the RICs also, I think, allow some breaking down of the boundaries between schools, so that it becomes easier for practitioners in one school to cross boundary into another school uh, where they may have a shared agenda around particular pedagogical improvements. Um, and uh, there, there has to be capacity in that, so there is some additional funding, but I think that was one of the reasons why Education Scotland have recruited uh, additional staff, because they have kind of de, uh, decentralised themselves so that they, they have people attached to the collaborators uh, in order to promote that kind of pedagogical input. But the, the case that you cite around the regional improvement uh, plans was one of the areas where we did raise very serious concerns when that was articulated, uh, because we were saying, well, how, how many improvement plans does a school have to comply with? Uh, and when is it going to find time to actually do anything um, if it's got to tick all these boxes? Now, I think Stephen kind of alluded to there that effectively what is called the regional improvement plan is more a kind of a work stream around how they provide support to the local authorities uh, and schools around the improvement plans that have been established there. So the regional improvement plan doesn't go through the collaborative process that a school improvement plan should go through, you know, where staff are involved in discussing school priorities. Um, it's, mo it's more, I think, uh, how you manage the, the work stream. But it's a, it was a good example of, well, this could, this could grow arms and legs very quickly um, if suddenly there's a regional improvement plan, which local authority staff are saying to schools, you have to comply with this. Um, I, I think we're, we're fairly clear, although perhaps not all schools are clear that the regional improvement plan is actually about how support is provided rather than creating um, work streams for schools. But some of that, to be fair, is still being teased out and it's slightly different in different areas because the dynamics of some of the collaboratives are entirely different because of scale and their particular challenges. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Thank you. you. Uh, Claire, Hi. last questions. Thank you, Canadina. Um, I, I tried to get in on this earlier on because there was a point in the, the discussion that I thought it was really pertinent that um, it was our, our kind of final theme we were looking at today. Um, and it's to do with the parental and pupil participation, which, you, uh, Larry, you were talking a lot about some of the um, issues concerning that, as had Councillor McCabe. I'm really interested in, in what how that engagement is going to work, particularly since they're not involved in the implementation process and parents aren't involved in that process, how are you engaging them during your work for that? And also, um, actually, um, I'm a substitute member of the committee, so I've not followed it right the way through, so this may have been discussed, and sorry that has, that even talking just about parental engagement, it, it sort of almost sends a message to some people that are in the care of young people that this might not be for them. So I particularly want to, to know what thoughts have been put into foster carers, to kinship carers, or those who may be look, looking after, looked after children, 
either in the third sector or in, in council establishments? I, th I mean, I think the I think that that whole area highlights um, the importance of looking at practice at a school level rather than looking at structural change up here, because you can do whatever you like up here, but actually, if the school doesn't have a, a teacher who can spend an afternoon working with a group of parents around their child's learning, or a homeschool liaison person, or doesn't have an educational psychologist who can be brought in to support uh, a family in crisis, then all of the ambitions around engaging parents uh, it, you know, comes to nothing, because it has to be resourced. Um, particularly if you are working with parents who, for various reasons, um, are not inclined towards working or don't feel that they can work as effectively with the school as perhaps other parents, people who face challenges in their own lives, because all of that is labour intensive. It is about actually having one-to-one -one discussions uh, and having networks there. Now, again, there, there are actually lots of really good examples of where schools have actually worked really well with local communities to involve parents in a meaningful way. Sometimes we're having parents in the classroom, sometimes we're having uh, classes for parents uh, to provide support to parents around uh, their school, you know, supporting their, school, their, their children's own learning. Um, but it's about trying to establish that in a much, uh, a much more coherent way, I think. Um, if you have children going through the school system at the moment, um, you probably experience a different system. If you even look at secondary schools' qualifications, uh, you know, people still talk about O levels. Um, you know, and the, so I think there's a, a lot of parents are slightly frustrated because they would like to be more hands-on supporting their children, but it's quite difficult. Um, so finding the time for teachers to talk to parents meaningfully rather than, you know, 20 minutes and a parent's night once a year um, or finding ways for the school to engage in parents, all of that, I think, is an agenda which, which has to be resourced. And I think that's where the local authority... Uh, you know, as a, as a, a, a the Gerthic approach around providing, looking at multi-agency around, around that, is really important. Pupil voice, I think, is also uh, very important. Um, so we're we're in, we in favour of pupil voice, but we did actually have a motion at our AGM raising a caution around it because um, there are around the appointments process, for example, it, the, there are some concerns around pupils being involved in appointment processes because appointment processes might be internal and people as employees have certain rights to confidentiality. So the, uh, I think pupil voice has to be exercised in a way that's meaningful for young people so that they're actually being listened to rather than just you know, having a pupil council meeting and sending the minutes to the head teacher. Um, you know, and uh, school uniform is still in place even if the council doesn't want it. Uh, so it has to be more about um, pupil voice, I think, uh, most effectively in terms of well, how do you articulate your thoughts on particular subjects and lessons? Right, if you think, um, you know, if you think things in your school could be improved around the timetable, how do you get the information to do that? Uh, I think it's quite easy to say these things uh, and, and tick a box and be in favour of it. The practicalities of actually delivering it um, are quite time-consuming um, and, and need the resource. Obviously, is in the widest sense, so it does obviously involve carers, foster carers, etc. In terms of we we've signed up to the to the national joint action plan, we've, we've, uh, and it's about disseminating that good practice. And only yesterday, uh, my council approved a new parental engagement strategy, uh, and it's not simply about um, getting people along to parent councils. It's about how you engage uh, parents and carers, etc., and their child's learning in the widest sense, and how you try and break down those those barriers. I mean, one of the issues highlighted in the discussion yesterday was the fact that um, not many uh, male parents uh, engage in their children's education, and what specific measures can we do to try and en en engage? And recognising, obviously, uh, lots of families have huge barriers, and, and how do we try and ad address that? And I think it's part of the remit of, of Education Scotland that they, again, will, will carry out a thematic inspection and try to ensure that, obviously, that good practice has been widely disseminated. So, absolutely, it's, it's a crucial part of this agenda, engaging parents and carers in their children's education. 
Right, thank you very much. In that case, uh, that brings us to the end of the questions for this panel of witnesses. Can I thank you all for coming along to give evidence today? That was very useful indeed. Thank you. We'll take a suspend for a couple of minutes to allow the witnesses to change over before continuing.
Can I reconvene the meeting and welcome John Swinney, Cabinet Secretary for Education and Schools, Claire Hicks, Deputy Director, Learning Directorate, and Andrew Bruce, Deputy Director, Learning Directorate, Scottish Government. I understand that the Cabinet Secretary will make a short opening statement. Uh, thank you, Convener. Uh, I welcome the opportunity to discuss the issues of uh, school empowerment with the committee this morning, and it forms a part of the Government's agenda to improve education and the life chances of our children and young people. Uh, we believe that the approach that is taken within the Empowering Schools agenda is critical to ensuring that young people are able to have access to the high quality learning and teaching that is necessary to deliver improvements in Scottish education. We've consulted extensively on how best to empower and support our schools. We've listened carefully to education professionals, local authorities, parents and pupils who told us strongly that they support the principle of empowering schools. We took careful account of the impact uh, and the input of the International Council of Education Advisors that legislation could create a distraction from some of the central agendas of the government uh, is pursuing to improve education. And as a consequence, we came to the conclusion in consultation with our local authority partners after extensive joint working that we could take an alternative and quicker route to school empowerment by working jointly with local government and other partners in this respect. Our landmark agreement with local government will see meaningful school empowerment through the Head Teachers Charter, together with improved parental involvement and pupil participation commencing across Scotland during this uh, school year. We know that this collaborative approach can work. We've worked extensively with local government to reach an agreement to establish regional improvement collaboratives and the 2018-19 regional improvement plans have been delivered uh, this week and are currently being assessed by Education Scotland. This has been achieved at pace, in partnership and without new legislation. Our partners have made clear their commitment to empowering our schools right across the education system and we are committed to putting our trust into the power of partnership working. We have always recognised that legislation alone would not drive the improvements that we need. That will take a balanced combination of changes to culture and practice, enhanced capacity and supporting structure. We will continue to work closely with local government, the teacher unions and other stakeholders to ensure this balanced approach is developed and implemented with pace and with purpose. We are putting in place additional resources and enhanced capacity and support to ensure the principles of school empowerment are fully implemented. Uh, we have published the Education Bill in draft so that stakeholders can see our clear policy intention and the detailed proposals, and we will carefully monitor progress during the current academic year and will return to Parliament with legislation if meaningful empowerment is not being delivered. But I remain confident that the agreement that we have reached with local government provides us with an effective route to ensure the empowerment of our schools, and I look forward to working with partners to deliver that agenda. Thank you very much, Cabinet Secretary. Uh, I will now invite questions from members of the committee and begin with Tavish. Uh, thank you very much. Um, Deputy First Minister, you again said this morning, or just now, that um, if there wasn't meaningful empowerment uh, by, I guess, June of 2019, you'd reintroduce the legislation. Could you define for the committee what meaningful empowerment means? Well, meaningful empowerment will be a progress to implement the agreement that we've reached with local government. And uh, I published that agreement back in, in June. Um, I welcome the fact that the constructive dialogue that we took forward with local authorities um, has resulted in that agreement, which uh, certainly addresses the policy agenda and considerations that I have brought to this debate. And uh, I will make an assessment uh, in the course of this year, uh, the latter part of this year, as to whether sufficient progress has been made. I would say at the outset that I don't, um, I don't consider that everything has got to be achieved within 12 months. That would be unreasonable. Um, but I have to see signs of good progress uh, to uh, implement that agenda that's been reached, to, uh, that, that agreement that's been reached with local government uh, to inform my decision at that time. And are the, um, are the signs of progress about the principles that are in the agreement or are they about practical measures that we, we as a committee and multiple point teachers and parents could understand? It will be a bit of both. Um, it will be uh, developing some, there's some further thinking that has to go into the definition of some of the concepts within the agreement. Um, I think one of the points I made in my opening remarks and I made it in my parliamentary statement is that when the government consulted on the question of school empowerment, there was pretty broad agreement about the principle and the desirability of school empowerment and the flexibility that would bring. 
but there was disagreement about some of the practical propositions that the government had put forward. So part of my rationale in taking the approach that I have taken is to essentially accept that in principle agreement about the advantages of empowerment and what that can do to improve learning and teaching within our schools, but then to work actively with partners to make sure that the agreed practical propositions address all of the inevitable practical issues that arise when we're taking forward principles of that nature. So the, will, um, the, the, the agreement that we've reached, I think, sets out a very clear direction of travel, but it does not prescribe or define every detail of that journey. And that's what essentially we need to work on with our partners. And I'm very pleased with the progress that's been made over the summer in advancing that discussion. Well, that's helpful because um, just, this, just this now, Cosler said that um, there had been one meeting yesterday that took place at officer level between involving Education Scotland and other partners, I assume also Scottish Government civil servants. And that was the first meeting at which the staff associations, i.e. the EIS, had been present. Would you recognise that for any of this to actually uh, be uh, meaningful in terms of teachers, the EIS and other staff <coughs> associations must be part of that process? That, that, that's why they're there. Uh, well, I think why were they I, there beforehand? Well, because I think what we had to get, we had to get, we had to get things in the proper order. Uh, the proper so order. It's just not having the staff involved in uh, the staff no, is not the proper I, order. If I just, if I, if I work my way through my answer to, to Mr. Scott, the proper order was for the government to come to an agreement with those responsible in statute for the running of our education system, which is our local authorities. And I've invested significant amounts of time in making sure that we could get to a point of agreement so that we proceed with a shared agenda with local government. And that's the. Um, uh, and in all of that uh, process, We've obviously had input from our staff associations and professional associations on a constant basis. What I wanted to do once we got to agreement with uh, local authorities was to ensure that we then had the, pref the professional associations involved in taking forward that agenda, and that's the process that started yesterday. No, indeed. Um, uh, Jane O'Donnell from COSLA said to us just now that um, she, and I hope I'm going to quote her reasonably accurately, that it will not be uh, able to have accurate measures for progress, to measure progress uh, within 10 months. And therefore, that was her, uh, her uh, assessment as an officer working with your colleagues in, in other parts of the government. Do you agree with that assessment? I, I think I, 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 I can understand the, the point that, that uh, Jane and Donald is making, um, but it's not a requirement that I'm applying to the system. What I've said in my original answer to Mr Scott is that uh, I would make a judgment based on the, the amount of progress that we're making in, in developing an agreed agenda, an in-principle agenda. And um, when it comes to measuring the progress that we're making in education, uh, the framework for measuring the progress that we want to make in education was very clearly set out when we published the National Improvement Framework last December, including the um, the, the, the monitoring framework that's in place to, to, to assess the progress that we're making on improving outcomes for young people and in closing the poverty-related attainment gap. So there is a, a measurement framework in place to assess the progress that we're making on improving performance and in securing our objectives within Scottish education. The assessment about the progress that we're making on empowering schools will be um, a, a process in which uh, I assess uh, the uh, amount of work that is able to be undertaken and uh, to be implemented as a consequence of the partnership agreement that we've put in place. So they're two rather different things. So, the, so it is very different. The, how children are doing at school is very different from the empowerment agenda. Uh, no, it's what we've got a framework in place to assess how young people are doing at school and what progress they are making. I believe the empowerment agenda contributes to that, which is why we're taking the route that we are taking yeah. to implement these measures and to do that in for, this fashion. Forgive me for being stupid. I'm just trying to understand how you're going to measure and therefore Parliament's going to judge how much progress is being made by next summer. Because what you're effectively saying is if, if you don't think enough progress is being made, you're going to reintroduce the legislation or introduce the legislation formally into Parliament. So we would need to know as a committee, you know, I hope you'd appreciate, well, what I would the say, criteria well, you're, you're well, going I would, to use. Well, I would, I would set out my rationale to Parliament once, uh, once we get to that point. But I don't think it would be fair for me to prejudge the process and say um, that we'll have to get to this point by the end of June next year. I'm saying that we've got, an imprint, we've got an agreement here between national and local government. Mm -hmm. uh, I want to, I'm, I'm very pleased that we've reached that point. I welcome the commitments that have been made to the agenda by local government, 
and I want to make as much progress as we can on that as swiftly as we possibly can do. And that is, in my opinion, a shared objective with our local government partners. And I think it would be wrong for me then to say, and it must re reach this benchmark and it must reach that benchmark within this school year. Um, I will see uh, how much progress is able to be made and make a judgment which I will transparently share with Parliament uh, when the time comes. I mean, Councillor Stephen McCabe obviously said to us earlier on that these questions are all matters for you rather than for him in making that judgment. What I'm just trying to understand is how you'll make, is, is what are the criteria on which you'll make the judgment? Because it's very difficult for us as a committee to, to come to any kind of objective assessment if we don't know what the criteria well, are. Well, I, well, I, I, but I think it would be wrong for me to specify the criteria that I've got to We've got an in-principle agreement. We yeah. want to see it implemented. I understand that. And, and, I, and, I, and I want to see as much progress made. And there may be practical issues that we need to spend more time working on. And as we work our way through some of them, some of them may take longer than we expect. And I. I could say today, well, OK, you've got to reach this landmark point by the end of June of next year. And then as we go through the work, we could find some technical issues that might take us longer to work our way through, might take us four months as opposed to two months. And then that becomes, that deadline becomes difficult to reach. Now, um, you know, there could be a perfectly rational and reasonable uh, argument as to why that is the case. So I don't want to prejudge that. Mm -hmm. I just want to go into this uh, with the in the spirit of partnership which has encapsulated this work and to make as much progress as we can. And then I'll make a judgment uh, as to whether or not I think that's enough progress has been made, whether goodwill has been deployed in that process uh, to advance this agenda. And I'm confident that exists within our local government partners. That's fine. But as of now, here the first week of September, as a parliamentary committee, uh, am I fair to say that, that I, as a, a member of that committee and as the committee, we don't know what the criteria are that this process is going to be judged by? Well, I think what the committee can judge it all by, based on is on the agreement that has been formulated between national well, and local government. That's principle level. That's absolute principle yeah, level. Yes, and, and then it's the committee can see that. Uh, that's, that's been published on an open basis. Mm. And the committee, um, like me, uh, can look at the progress that's been made, can ask for the evidence of what progress has been made and make a judgment as to how much progress has been made in implementing that agreement and advancing and uh, developing that agreement. What I think would be wrong for me to do is to say, uh, here are some milestones that you must reach within 12 month, uh, a 12 month period, because I think that would run contrary to the spirit of joint collaborative working that we're taking forward. OK, finally, um, just to, uh, Larry Flanagan of EIS and Councillor Stephen McCabe as the lead official, lead, sorry, councillor for COSLA, both said that they think it's unhelpful to have legislation being held in reserve. They do not think that is consistent with the very sound principle you've, you've just uh, enunciated around collaboration. Don't you think it'd be a good idea just to drop that legislation altogether? It, no, I think it's there as an option that I can bring forward if necessary. I don't think they think it's an option. They think it's something rather worse than that. It, they well, said that to the committee this morning. Well, it's, well it's, it's, it, it remains for me an option that I can bring forward if sufficient progress is not made. Mm. OK, thank you. It, the, there's, there's a number of people want to bring in, uh, want to ask supplementaries, but can I ask you, before you do, make them short and just one question or else wait your turn and take questions because you're cutting across other people's time. Uh, that Ross, Mary and then Joanne. Thanks, Convener. Um, Deputy First Minister, you've said that you will explain your rationale to ourselves as the committee as Parliament in 10 months' time. The school year has started. Teachers and pupils are aware that they are being judged over the next 10 months, but they don't know what they're being judged on. Is that fair? It's not, to the, it's not a characterisation I would accept because it's not a judgment about schools. It's a judgment about the way in which our partners take forward the agreement that has been reached. So, for example, um, the... Um, that the agreement envisages the formulation of a head teacher's charter. So it, that's about us doing the work within, our, uh, within the various partners involved to develop that concept and to take it forward. It doesn't involve us judging the performance of individual schools in the process. Entries one question and answer and then move on. No, but uh, but, but yeah. you know, my response to Mr Scott earlier on said that there's a very clear measurement framework in place just now, which is... Um, considering and measuring the closure of the poverty-related attainment gap. That was published last December. Um, it's not changing as a framework. That's publicly known about and understood. And uh, I see across the country schools very focused on the task of closing the poverty-related attainment gap, which is the crucial measurement framework within Scottish education.
Yeah, if you need to come back, you can come back when you're asking your further questions. Mary, and then Joanne. Very Thank you. Just very briefly to follow on the, the, the point you made about the framework that's currently in place for measuring attainment, which you said sits separately from this agenda. And you've just said that that's not going to change. But you've also said that this empowerment agenda, improvement agenda, will have an impact on that framework. Is that still your view that throughout the year you won't revisit that framework? Uh, no, I won't, because what that framework is about is about identifying, we consulted extensively on this, about the range of factors which would give us a rounded assessment of whether the poverty related attainment gap was closing. Now, I see the empowerment agenda as contributing helpfully and beneficially to that task. So, our objectives, so th this is all consistent with our policy agenda to close the poverty related attainment gap. And we have a measurement framework in place to assess um, how we are um, performing on that challenge. And um, so, so all of these measures and reforms contribute towards advancing that agenda, which is measured by the framework that was published last December and which I believe, um, after extensive consultation, uh, commands widespread confidence across the education system. Thank you. Joanne? It's very specifically on this question of how... Um, you know, you're going to make progress in nine months, ten months' time. You'll make a judgment, but you haven't set, established any criteria. How will COSLA know how they're going to, what they have to do in order to make sure that you don't, in ten months' time, decide there's not enough progress being made? I, I think it's pretty obvious that um, we are working. Vi right. Pardon? Well, that's one question. Uh, well, I think it's pretty obvious that the government and local government is working well together on this agenda. So I am approaching this in a spirit of partnership to uh, advance an agreement, which is a, um, a different approach to the one that the government set out. And of course, I've been you know, criticised for changing tack on that, but I've changed tack because I've listened to people. And uh, in the spirit of cooperation and partnership that we're taking forward, um, I'm committed to making that judgment within the same uh, spirit that has led us to what I consider to be a really valuable agreement that advances the reform agenda in Scottish education. And, um, I, I, and, and quite clearly, uh, I will set out my rationale at the end of this year about how much progress has been made um, I will do that after dialogue and consultation with COSLA. I won't do it um, uh, without undertaking that dialogue um, and uh, will clearly communicate to Parliament my decisions and my consideration at that time. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Oliver, it's now your question. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Convener. Uh, Cabinet Secretary, I wondered just off what you've said just there and uh, the reference to the proper order of things you made in response to Mr Scott. Do you think you've got the approach right so far on these reforms? Uh, yes. So, I mean, usually people try uh, non-legislative measures and uh, collaboration first. Why have we spent a significant amount of time looking at a piece of legislation that you now no longer feel is required? Well, what we've been... We actually haven't been looking at a piece of legislation because the piece of legislation... Well, if you like. well, but that's that, that's that, and that's that's a very important point. We've been having a debate about the policy intention of empowering schools to be more influential in designing the education of children and young people across the country. That's been the policy objective that I have been interested in, and the government has consulted about that in relation to the possibility of taking that forward through legislation. So the policy intention of the government has not changed in any way, shape or form. Uh, what we have made progress on is a dialogue with our local authority partners, which enables us to take that approach forward without the requirement to legislate and to do it in a spirit of partnership. Because I recognise that the concept of empowering schools it's just not, it's not just created by legislation. It needs to be a change of culture within our education system. And legislation doesn't always um, routinely deliver a change in culture. So if that's so, your belief and the policy intention hasn't changed, why did we not start 
uh, from a point of view of creating that dialogue. Because you know, un un under your assessment, the time that's been spent consulting around potential legislation is time time wasted. Is it, it not? No, it's, it's not at all. It's been time very beneficial time spent, in my opinion, because. What we have got is we've had an extensive debate about how we can take forward the concept of school empowerment. And as I said in my earlier answer to Mr Scott, there are the consultation exercises that we undertook very clearly came forward with in principle support and backing for the concept of school empowerment, but a number of issues about the detail and the practicalities of how we might do that. And essentially, the conclusion I've come to is that if there is widespread support in the education system for empowering schools, let's work together to make sure that we do the detail in a collaborative way so that this works effectively and that children and young people in Scotland feel the benefit of it swiftly within the education system. And that's why we've ended up at the position that we've ended up in. And I think that's something where the government, I quite clearly have listened to the opinions of other people. Um, I've tried to work in partnership. We made good progress on the establishment of regional improvement collaboratives, despite the fact that there was initial resistance to some of those concepts. And I think the benefits of that are now begun to be felt within our education system, and so with the agenda on empowering schools. I, I, I hear what you're saying, but I mean, listening this morning to the first panel, it didn't sound like progress was going to be rapid. Education Scotland effectively seemed to be talking about spending the next year working out the baseline, uh, working out how empowered schools are at the moment. How then, when there are no uh, defined timescales, no prescribed objectives, can we be confident that this approach will deliver results faster than legislation? Well, I, I, I disagree with the characterisation that Mr Mandela has put on this. There is a shared agreement between national and local government about the empowerment of schools within our education system. And that involves a number of uh, components, uh, not least of which is the Head Teachers Charter, uh, to which there is agreement between national and local government. So um, we will take forward that agenda. Um, I've uh, spent some time with the committee already setting out the fact that uh, obviously there'll be an assessment made about the amount of progress that's made. But it, it follows logically that if the, we're starting work on implementing this agreement now, and there are some, you know, the Head Teachers Charter will be published before the end of this year. Um, that would not have been provided for if we'd gone to legislation, because the legislation, the earliest that the legislation could have been implemented, um, conceivably, although I think this would have been pretty ambitious, would have been uh, uh, autumn 2019, much more likely to be autumn 2020. But here we are in the autumn of 2018, making progress on the implementation of this agenda already. And I think that's good for children and young people in Scotland. Yeah, um, I understand that you're saying about implementing this agenda, but do you, do you think that the process of implementation will be complete by the time legislation would have passed? Um, well, I, I think there'll be, uh, th that's difficult for me to prescribe at this stage, but I think we'll have, achieved, we'll have made a great deal more progress on implementing... So long-term no, no, progress wait, wait, could wait, potentially be slower? Wait a second. Uh, uh, no. Um, we will make more progress on implementing this agreement than would have been done if we'd gone for a legislative approach. And uh, I think that's something that should be welcomed because we are advancing the agenda at a faster pace than would have been possible with legislation. OK, um, and just a final question to go back a stage. I was interested in why uh, your approach had changed. Uh, Stephen McCabe suggested that parliamentary arithmetic could have had something to do with that. Is, is that uh, correct? Not in the slightest, no, because I, I, I understand that there's a parliamentary support for the measures in the Education Bill. Indeed, I read about that in the newspapers at the weekend. Excellent. Thank you. OK, thank you very much, Cabinet Secretary. Can, can I ask, I'm just going to bring... Uh, Liz Smith on, on capacity and culture, but just on, on the reform process, there's a lot of talk about in June 2019, you know, you'll make a decision if, if legislation is required, etc. Is there any possible benefit for the Scottish Government in bringing forward legislation if between now and June 2019, you, COSLA, the EIS, have all been working together collaboratively, cooperatively, even if there are hiccups in that? Can you envisage a situation where at that time you would think, right, OK, we've heading the right track, we've hit some bumps, those bumps are too big, we're going to bring in legislation? 
I, I, I can't envisage that situation between now and June 2019 because um, <coughs> the agreement that we have reached with local government has been reached in good faith. Um, I am. Um, um, I think it's been a good process that we've been involved in. I think we have um, benefited from the active involvement of uh, local government in the formulation of our policy propositions, and I have no reason to believe that that climate will change uh, in, as we move forward with the implementation of the agreement that we've reached. OK, thank you. Uh, Liz? Uh, thank you, convener. Um, Mr Swinney, this time last year, both yourself and the First Minister said very forcibly on the record uh, in various uh, situations that this bill, the proposed bill, um, and I stress the word bill, was absolutely critical in terms of uh, delivering education reform. And obviously, over the course of the year, you completely changed your mind on that. And you're citing the fact for the reason for the change in your view was the uh, information and the feedback you were getting from stakeholders and also what the OECD were telling you in their uh, very important report uh, of three years ago. That feedback was there at the time when you made the pronouncements about the bill being so vital. So can you tell us, this committee, what is it specifically that made you change your mind when that information that you say was very important in changing your mind was there before you actually announced uh, your desire to have a very important bill? I suppose I'd highlight two factors. Um, the first is that um, the, it became clear to me as we consulted on the legislative proposals that there was um, very broad support for the principle of school empowerment right across the education system in Scotland, um, but there was substantial disagreement about the detail of all of that. And what I wanted to make sure was that I built on the agreement that was reached, um, the, the agreement that was emerging about school empowerment, and essentially captured that opportunity and uh, to, to take forward the reform agenda. The second thing was the fact that we had already managed to get to a position on regional improvement collaboratives, which at the very beginning, which was actually one of the key issues raised by the OECD in the 2015 report was the, the lack of collaboration within the education system. That was their assessment of Scottish education. The fact that we'd managed to make progress from um, original resistance to the concept of regional improvement collaboratives to active participation and co-production of the design of regional collaboratives gave me confidence that there was a route that could be taken forward that would take the education system um, very actively with me on this agenda. So it's those two factors that essentially um, weighed heavily on my mind. Uh, I was also influenced um, by the commentary from the International Council of Education Advisors, who have essentially uh, believed that the Scottish Government's education agenda is soundly focused and anchored. Uh, but they gave me um, some cautionary advice that uh, pursuing a legislative approach to the reforms that I was trying to take forward might not create the desire, uh, as good an outcome as if I took forward a collaborative approach, which I had already made progress on, on the regional improvement collaboratives. So those are the factors that weighed in my mind. And um, I felt it was important that I listened carefully to the feedback that came to me through the consultation exercises and tried to capture um, that input to make sure that we took forward an effective reform agenda. So, Mr Swinney, where is the logic in leaving the uh, draft bill uh, on the shelf that should, be, should it be required will be drawn out again? Because that doesn't quite fit with what you've just said. You're well, either in favour of a bill to make these changes or not? Which is it? Well, what, what, what I'm in favour of is making the changes. That's what I'm in favour of. And that's where my policy agenda has been absolutely consistent. I'm in favour of empowering schools. So I fought the 2016 election on. That's what I'm pursuing. The issue we're having here is a discussion about what's the, what's the most appropriate route to do that. And originally, my view was that we had to pursue that objective through legislation. By the cooperative approach that we've been able to construct with local government, I've come to the view 
that there is a, a, an alternative approach which is founded in the agreement that we have reached. And that's why we've ended up where we've ended up. So when this, this time next year, let's say, when you as Cabinet Secretary are looking at the uh, progress that has been made, and in relation to the comment that you made earlier this morning, that the key thing, and it's very much in this statement uh, from the First Minister yesterday, about uh, the drive to narrow the attainment gap, that's the overall arching aim of this government. What criteria will you be looking at to decide whether or not that progress has been made? Because I think we have a duty to tell parents that, I think we have a duty to tell local authorities that, and our schools. What will you be looking at as Cabinet Secretary to decide whether there has been progress or not? Well, I, 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 th th there, are, there are two distinctive elements to, to, to this point. And I, I've gone through some of them in my answers to Mary Fee and to Tavish Scott already. The measurement of whether we are closing the attainment gap will be determined by the framework we put in place last December when we published the National Improvement Framework. So anybody that wants to see whether we're making progress or not will be able to look at those indicators, and those indicators will demonstrate whether we are closing the gap or whether we are not. So that's, that's all out there already, and that framework will not be changing. So, so, if, so to answer Liz Smith's direct question, what would a parent look at to decide is the attainment gap in Scotland being closed? They should look at the reporting on the framework that we published last December. Now, the other distinctive part of this question is about what is the, you know, what is the, the impact of the reforms that we are undertaking? Because there's a whole host of factors that will affect our ability to close the poverty-related attainment gap. It won't just be this reform agenda. It will be what we're investing in the Scottish Attainment Challenge. It's what we're investing in pupil equity funding. It's what local authorities will be doing to support individual schools. It will be what individual schools are doing to change their practice, to improve the quality of learning and teaching, or to support young people to overcome the impact of adverse childhood experiences. There will be a whole host of factors that will influence whether we close the poverty-related attainment gap, but we have an open, transparent framework that measures whether we are doing it or whether we are not. And the reform agenda, I believe, will help us contribute to that because it will empower the individuals we need to empower to have the most impact on children's education, the length and breadth of Scotland. So just as a final point, Cabinet Secretary, and I hope this is not um, what's going to happen, but if there was no improvement in the basic um, issues with the attainment gap, if there was no improvement in literacy and numeracy standards this time next year, what will you do in terms of the legislative process? Will you continue to go for a collaborative approach or will you reintroduce the bill as you intimated uh, in June? But those, two, those two questions in my mind are not directly related. Um, the progress on closing the attainment gap will not influence my decision on whether sufficient progress has been made on this reform agenda. Because as I said a moment ago, the closure of the poverty-related attainment gap is influenced by a whole host of different factors within government policy, whether it's the attainment challenge, pupil equity funding, the, approach, the, the multidisciplinary approach to uh, tackling adverse childhood experiences, about the enhancements of learning and teaching, about the improvements in leadership, about the role of Columba 1400, all sorts of factors will influence the closure of the poverty-related attainment gap. Um, I certainly will not be taking a view that um, the progress that we make on, the, on closing the poverty-related attainment gap will lead me to take a different stance on whether we should have this, this should be taken forward in legislation or not. My decision on whether or not this should be taken, this agenda should be taken forward through legislation will be driven by how much progress is made in implementing the joint agreement we have reached with COSLA. I, I, just for clarification, Cabinet Secretary, and as I say, I repeat, I really hope this does not happen, but if there was an ongoing situation where the attainment gap is very stubborn, as we all know that it is, at what stage would you review whether it has been right to go for a non-legislative process? Uh, well, I, I, I fear I'm just going to say the same things I've just said a moment ago, because that's exactly the same question that Lizmith put to me, and I'm, essentially, I'm trying to answer it 
as helpfully as I can, I think there's a whole range of factors that will affect our ability to close the poverty-related attainment gap. But in short, if, it is, if we do not see progress on closing the poverty-related attainment gap, I will not use that as a justification for turning this pro agreement into legislation, providing sufficient progress has been made on implementing this agreement by our joint collaborative approach with local government. Uh, Ross. Thanks, Convener. Um, Deputy First Minister, do you believe that classroom assistance and additional support needs assistance provide valuable and distinct roles to schools? Uh, yes, I do. Why doesn't the uh, teacher census supplementary data classify them as separate categories, which it has always done up until this year? They're now classed as a single category, people support assistance. Um, well, the government statisticians have taken the view that um, the, um, the, 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 these two roles essentially um, are contributing to the same area of activity within individual schools. Therefore, that data combined provides a more representative position of the employment of individuals um, in, as part of the school census. You've just said yourself that those are distinct roles, and they are. There's a huge difference between those who work specifically with children who have additional support needs and those who do not. How are we able to scrutinise something like this if there is no longer a distinction in the categories of data? And if I could add to that, this data is no longer published with the supplementary data for the census. It is available on request afterwards because it is no longer put through a quality assurance process like other elements of the data. Why is that the case? Um, well, I think that on the issue of quality assurance, there have been some um, significant issues in ensuring that that data was of a standard that could be published by um, uh, our statisticians. Um, and they've had to interrogate quite significantly some of the data that has emerged. So there's a data quality issue that our, our statisticians have had to wrestle with. Um, but fundamentally, um, they've taken the view that in trying to, prevent, to provide the broadest um, assessment of employment uh, and the characteristics of the workforce, that is better to present this information in that fashion. The government's keen to emphasise the STEM agenda and the importance that you place on it. Um, do school technicians have a role to play in advancing the STEM agenda in education? Um, they will do, yes. School technicians uh, are a category that has been dropped completely from the supplementary data for the teacher census. Do you believe that's a good idea? Um, obviously, there are judgments made by um, our statisticians about what is the appropriate uh, presentation and collection of information. and. It's important that we have a sense of the entire workforce, um, but fundamentally um, the, um, the, there will be issues which our statisticians have wrestled with about the ability to provide quality data based on the variety of different categories and classific classification of support workers, which have made it difficult to put in place um, consistent data uh, in, in some of the employment categories that Mr Greer raises. Do you believe that to fulfil your role as the Cabinet Secretary for Education, you benefit from knowing how many technicians there are in Scottish schools? Well, ultimately, these issues are uh, a matter for local authorities as they employ the staff who, pr who provide services within our individual schools. Do you believe that you should know how many technicians there are in Scottish schools? Well, I think we've got a very broad cross-section of information about the employment of individuals within our schools. And um, I get a, a significant amount of that information. But fundamentally, there are in the decisions about the recruitment of staff at local level um, are currently taken exclusively by our local authorities and local authorities have to make a judgment about the employment that is, that is undertaken at that level. Decisions I'm asking about the availability of the data through publications of the Scottish Government. You mentioned that these are decisions taken by the statisticians. Do they consult with those in education before making changes to the data that they collect and the data that they publish? Uh, they will do, yes. 
who in education would that be? For a decision like this, are, are you made aware of a decision like that before it's taken? Uh, I'm, I'm made aware of the decision that is taken, uh, yes, but I don't take these decisions. Do you feel that the government is fulfilling its obligation to openness and transparency? I won't take you through the very long saga that I've had to collect this data, but it is typically published in December. The teacher census this time around was not published until March. The supplementary data not till July. The data that we've been discussing here, I had to request after that. And as we discussed, it was not put through a quality assurance process. Well, I think that I think, and the reasons for all of that, uh, if my recollection is, is correct, is about data quality issues that statisticians wrestled with as part of that process. It could, would it, it would be helpful for the committee, maybe, if we could get some of the reasons for that in writing Certainly. to, to, to the committee? Sure. Yeah. Because there seems to be a, a, a number of issues that have been resolved. Okay, thank you. Is that you, Ross? Yes, thanks. Great, thank you. Joanne? Can I just clarify, first of all, on the issue of the agreement with local government? Councillor McCabe said he did not know that the legislation was going to be shelved. So the agreement was in the context of the legislation. Has there been any change then to the, the agreement on the basis that we no longer have the legislation? No. And was there a particular reason why we didn't let, you didn't let COSLA know of the plans to drop the legislation oh, well, when, you were, I, when you were forming the agreement, it, well, given that we, the legislation was the context in which that agreement was discussed? Well, we formed, we, we formed, the, we formed the agreement um, as, as a consequence of some extensive discussions, and we got to agreement about the contents of uh, the bill um, some time I can't remember exactly when. I think it was probably approved by the COSLA leaders at the end of May, if my recollection is correct. Um, so we we had reached that point of agreement. Um, I then considered what was the best way to advance the agreement. I obviously drafted a bill consistent with that agreement, and um, the bill that uh, I published in draft form at uh, the end of June contained the... Um, uh, the provisions that were the subject of the agreement with local government. Uh, but I considered, uh, in the aftermath of reaching the agreement with COSLA, whether there was an opportunity to take this forward through uh, a collaborative route, given that we had made progress on the regional improvement collaboratives by exactly the same route. And that was the judgment I came to. Um, I shared that decision with Councillor McCabe before I announced it to Parliament, um, so um, I, I did advise local government of my intention to take a different course in my parliamentary statement, um, but it was based on a judgment that I thought there was more progress we could make over a swifter timescale by that voluntary it agreement. It wasn't a collaborative decision to stop the legislation. Uh, no, well, Can well, I well, check well, with well, you well, then? Well, there's, well, well, the well, there's, a very, there's a very important point in there. Councillor McCabe, is not the author of the legislation, nor would he claim to be. So it's a decision that, that, that's that, not the point that I would I'm have making. to take. And that's not the point I'm making, is that COSLA came to an agreement with you in the context of the legislation. You then decided to drop the legislation and then say that the reason you're doing that is because you've got this collaborative arrangement. But can I just clarify with you? Because one thing to say you're in favour of an improvement agenda, and I've just signed up to that. I think what was evident from the panel this morning, there's some pretty fundamental things that neither COSLA now, the teacher's representative agree with you on in terms of your, what that improvement looks like. So if we look at the, the head teacher's charter, I can ask why you're persisting in calling it a head teacher's charter when certainly the EIS and the National Parents Forum want it to be something like a more collegiate, which is a school charter, which is what leadership at every level inside a school feels like. And for those of us who are there, we know that the head teacher is one part of it, but we don't subscribe, many people do not subscribe, I think as the union described it as the hero leader model. Schools will not work on the basis of a hero leader model. So have you agreed that in looking for a charter, it will not be a head teacher's charter, but it will be something slightly different from that, which is how people work together um, in, in collaboration? Well, if we look at the agreement that um, has been reached between the government and local government and look at section nine, um, it sets out under the heading Agreement on the, teachers, the Head Teachers Charter um, a number of provisions in relation to um, what would be in the Head Teachers Charter. For example, it says that head teachers are responsible for deciding how best to design their local curriculum in line with Curriculum for Excellence. It goes on to say that head teachers should choose the staff who work in their school with due regard to employment law and the contractual obligations of their local authority. 
But it also goes on to say, uh, head teachers must work collaboratively with their staff, parents, pupils and wider partners, including other schools and their local authority, on curriculum design and improving learning and teaching. Well, this, what, well, well, the head teacher well, it is, because it says, at the top it says, agreement on the head teacher's uh -huh. charter. Uh -huh. So but it's a head effect, teacher's charter. In effect, you call it a head teacher's charter, that idea you empower a head teacher who delivers locally, is dynamic and all the rest of it. The reality is something different from that because both COSLA, parents, and uh, the unions express concern about them. Indeed, head teachers themselves express concern about the model. Well, I, I believe that head teachers should work collaboratively with their staff, parents, pupils, and wider partners. Mm. That's but, what I agree with. I've always do, believed but that. But it is different from the model that was in the legislation. Uh, no, or is it's it not. Exact same? No, it's not. It's is exactly it exact the same. same then? Of course it is. Because so the, the legislation, so because, well, to go back to my earlier answer to Joanne Lamont, this agreement is the basis upon which the legislation. Was, was crafted. So, but the and, and, was... The, and, and I've always believed that head teachers must op must operate in the fashion that we've talked about here. But I do believe that head teachers must be able to exercise more flexibility and have more control than they have just now. Which is why the provisions in this charter are so significant. So, can I ask then why you would resist the views of both the unions and the, the parents forum, which felt? that the idea that simply the authority goes to the individual head teacher is not appropriate and that it would be better to signal that it's something much more collegiate you're looking for and call it, for example, a schools charter, which would allow for accountability. And would you also recognise this morning in evidence that Council McCaig made it very clear that the responsibility of the head teacher and accountability to local government, local authority would remain the same? Um, well, obviously, Head teachers are employees of local authorities. Uh, at no stage have I advanced a proposition which would ever change that. Never. Nothing I've, I've ever said would have changed that position. So clearly, a line of accountability would have had to have been maintained between a head teacher and a local authority, and I never argued to change that. What this head teacher's charter does is significantly enhance the power and the flexibility of head teachers on a uniform basis across the country. Now, I accept that there are some schools in the country where head teachers currently choose their staff, but that's not always the case. It's not the case in every local authority area in the country. So there will be shifts in the relationship between individual local authorities and their head teachers. But at no stage did I ever argue for the um, the accountability or employment arrangement between a head teacher and a local authority to change as part of this process. I don't think it would be reasonable if you are going to take a collaborative approach that you acknowledge the proposals in the legislation that you have now shelved were not gathering support and that you have to be open in dealing with unions and with parents and with the local authorities and saying actually we need to do something slightly different from what was proposed in the legislation. Would you not at least concede that? Because I, I think the concern is, if I can just capture it this way, that you create the impression that you're going to get the exact same results from having legislation as not having legislation. But the problem is people regarded the legislation as difficult and not necessarily appropriate to, to achieve the aims we might more generally want around empowerment. So are you open to the concept that actually what will happen in terms of collaboration will not be what the bill was intended to deliver, but maybe something better? Uh, there's a, a number of points uh, that I'd like to address in there. Um, the first is that um, some of, over the last couple of years, all sorts of things have been said that were my policy intention, which were never my policy intention. For example, I read column inches about how I was going to academise Scottish education. At no stage was I ever going to academise Scottish education, but it was put about that I was going to academise Scottish education. So holding me to account for that model it might be interesting political sport, but it was never my intention. Second point I would say is that, the, and it follows up the point I made to Mr Mundell in my earlier answer, my policy intention throughout this has been to empower schools. And the debate has been about what's the best way to go about doing that. And what I was pleased about in the consultation exercises was that there was widespread support for empowering of, the empowerment of schools, but not for some of the
precise details that we put in the proposal. So we've got together with local government and we've come up with an agreement which, which certainly to my view, satisfies my objectives about the empowerment of schools and gives the necessary control to where I think it should rest within our education system, within our schools, with our head teachers, able to have an influence on the, um, the education of children and young people um, in uh, individual schools. So all of that, I think, is, uh, is an illustration of the fact that the policy agenda is being achieved as a consequence of all of this. And I think that approach is being offered to Parliament openly. I gave a statement to Parliament earlier on this year. I set out the, I published the agreement with local governments. It's there for people to see uh, openly and transparently. And from that, I think it's pretty clear that the policy agenda of empowering schools is one that's going to take its course with the dialogue with local government. It would be reasonable to suggest that empowerment of schools is not necessarily the same as the head teacher's charter as you captured it in the legislation. But it's possible uh, to be in favour of empowerment of schools, as councillors are, as EIS is, as parents are, without accepting your description of a head teacher's charter. And would therefore it not be at least reasonable to expect that you'd be open to the idea of a more collegiate approach, that it would be a school charter, rather than suggesting, as we suggested yesterday in the chamber, that we will get the same thing anyway. And the reason we're doing this is because we can get it more quickly. The head teacher's charter, as described in the legislation, will surely be open to a different approach if you accept that other people have a different view of how empowering schools would actually look. Well, the, 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 the bill that we've brought forward is based on the agreement that we've reached with local government, which includes provision for agreement on the head teacher's charter. So the bill, that is a, that's, a, that's a, a, an implicit we're part of, to, what we, of what we've put forward. Yeah, we're going round the circles here. We're getting asked the same questions and obviously get the same answers. So. Uh, OK, thank you. Uh, George, you wanted to come in? Yes, thank you. Convener, uh, good morning, Cabinet Secretary. I'd just like to go on about the point that you made yourself about what the reality of the situation is with regards to what you did propose and what was actually reported in uh, the column entries you spoke of. Because when I looked at... I'm starting to doubt whether I've been in the same room as some of my colleagues today, because when I listened to some of the uh, representatives here from partner organisations this morning, they were actually positive. They were, uh, they were looking forward to the challenge. They were wanting to work with government to try and make sure that we can find these solutions. Now, was I in a completely different room, uh, Cabinet Secretary, or is that the case with the organisations that you're working with? It, well, we, we've reached agreement with, um, with COSLA after an extensive uh, amount of dialogue, which is formulated in the, uh, the text of the joint agreement, which the committee will have seen. And... Um, that agreement satisfies um, my view of the, of the approach that we need to take to empower schools and to make sure that um, the, our head teachers are able to exercise responsibility as leaders of learning, that they are able to have um, much greater influence than they have today over staffing within their schools, that um, there is a much greater involvement for parents in the education process of young people, um, and that there are a whole suite of decisions that can be taken closer to children as a consequence of this agreement. And I welcome the fact that we've reached that point of agreement with our local authority partners, and I think it's a very sound basis for proceeding with this agenda. Can, can I just ask you about um, the, the inspection re regime? Because Education Scotland are going to carry out three new thematic inspections over the next year. And they'll be looking at readiness for empowerment, curriculum leadership and parent and pupil participation. Um, what discussions have you had to agree um, benchmark or criteria for Education Scotland to carry out those thematic inspections? Well, the, the inspectorate acts independently of ministers. So what the... the, the so the, 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 the contribution to the discussion that has taken place has been Education Scotland and Her Majesty's Inspectorate of Education making their contribution to a collective process with the government and local government saying, look, these are three elements of inspection that we think would be reasonable to take forward. And, um, uh, and, and that's exactly what Her Majesty's Inspectorate will do. So uh, it's the, 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 these are decisions formulated 
um, by Her Majesty's Inspector of Education, um, which are formulated independently of ministers. And how much weight will you put on the findings of those inspections to um, help to um, develop your understanding of success next year when you evaluate how well schools have done? I'll look very carefully at those um, inspection reports as I look very carefully at every single inspection report that comes out on a weekly basis from Her Majesty's Inspector. I see every one of those reports on a weekly basis, um, whether they're about nursery classes, primary schools, secondary schools, special schools, independent schools, or thematic inspections across different policy areas, or um, individual inspections of local authority education functions. And I look very carefully at every one of them on a weekly basis. Thank you. OK, thank you very much, Mary. Uh, we'll move on to the last question, which is from Tavish. Uh, sorry, Peter. Um, uh, yes, yeah, so I just wanted to ask um, one question about um, testing of uh, primary one pupils. Not about what you're going to, not about whatever may come this afternoon, which obviously I have no clue as to what's going to be said, but more about what appeared in the last couple of weeks in terms of advice to parents, which I think was of concern because it was contradictory advice. And I wonder, um, uh, Mr. Swinney, if you could just clarify why the government published advice that parents can't opt their children out of P1 tests. Uh, quoting Solar as an authority for that position when Solar then said they had given no such view. That was at very worst, uh, well, at very best, uh, a worrying difference of opinion. Um, I, 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 I will be going through some of these questions this afternoon, so I, I, I'll, um, the committee will... Um, uh, well, I, I, well I, I, obviously, I'm in Parliament just now, so I'll answer Mr Scott's question, so I hope I'm not creating some discourtesy upstairs. But, uh, I'm not asking you to explain the philosophy here of your go, position here, on testing. Here, here goes, yeah. Um, yeah. it's the best I can say. Um, the, Mr Scott said that the advice had, had, had changed or was different. I, I would contest that, that, that view. I think the view has been pretty consistently expressed, um, which I would best try to express it as follows. Um, there is no legislative provision for standardised assessments, but there is no legislative provision for uh, really anything in Scottish education as opposed to children and young people must be educated. So if there is no legislative provision for standardised assessments, there cannot be a legislative right to withdraw a child from an assessment. And that's been the consistent position the government has argued uh, over time. Now, there is, of course, and this has been clear throughout all of the dialogue that we've had, that where a parent or a carer is concerned about the appropriateness of their child participating in assessment, uh, they are free to raise that with individual schools. And if we look at the participation rate in, on standardised assessments, um, the participation rate is about 94%. Um, now, I would never expect it to be 100% because there will be some young people for whom it is not appropriate that they are undertaking standardised assessments. And I think that data demonstrates that point. Now, finally, on the point of, um, uh, of the SOLAR um, advice, um, essentially, my officials um, spoke to um, local authority lawyers um, and they thought they were getting a SOLAR position, but because they were speaking to the people within SOLAR who would um, be the closest to uh, some of the, 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 the issues that we were interested in uh, around about the issue of parental, uh, parental consent to, to ensure that we essentially um, were understanding their position. That was represented in a letter from one of my officials as a SOLAR position, and SOLAR have subsequently made it clear to us they do not offer a position of that type. So there was, it was presented in good faith, but I think we um, gave it a definition of the, of the source of the advice that was not appropriate for that to be done. So SOLAR presumably thought they were giving, uh, as it were, private advice to the government or... Not so much private advice. I think what was, going, what was happening was dialogue with people who are in the SOLAR organisation. But what subsequently be, became clear is that SOLAR do not provide a collective position. And that was, so that was not 
appropriately presented by us in that letter. Uh, and you know, I appreciate that. And the government obviously recognises this is incredibly sensitive for teachers and parents. Wouldn't it have been helpful to have then published another letter saying, that, well, saying what you've just said? Well, I've, 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 I have done that in, with, in collaboration with the Association of Directors of Education in Scotland, which I sent to the... I we got think this I sent to the yeah, we got this morning. Well, but, but it, it doesn't mention solar and the, the advice in that sense. Um, well, I, I, was, I was essentially trying to present the... Um, the, the, the position between the government and the Association of Directors of Education mm. to provide clarity. Mm. Uh, but in my statement this afternoon, I will address directly the solar okay. issue. Okay. But I, I would want to, to make it clear to the committee that um, the, the, um, the, the, the situation we found ourselves in this was an inadvertent situation. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Sorry, and I, I, I'd said Tavish was the last question, but I'd, I'd miss Claire. My apologies. Uh, just returning to the theme asked the first panel, um, Cabinet Secretary, about um, the um, children who are in perhaps kinship care, foster care, looked after children in um, either third sector or council run establishments. How do we ensure that all of the people involved in that um, feel part of this process and don't feel excluded by it and, and that the voice of um, looked after children will be heard as loudly as others? The, the key question here, or the key approach here is the focus on the whole child and um, obviously that's a, a central part of our approach to policy for children and young people and I want to make sure that in all circumstances um, uh, those who surround looked after children, support looked after children uh, are able to understand um, all of the support that is available to them and also that those responsible for the education of looked after children take due account of some of the specific challenges that looked after children will face as a consequence of, uh, uh, of their situation and to make sure their needs are, are adequately and fully met. And uh, the, uh, the working arrangements that we have with local government are designed to ensure that that whole child approach is able to be taken forward in that respect. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. That, that brings us to the end of uh, this public session. Uh, can I thank the Cabinet Secretary and the staff for their attendance? Uh, I now close the public session. We will now move into private session. I will suspend for a moment or two to allow witnesses and the gallery to leave before continuing. <laughs>